Diamond. Guardians of Hades Romance Series, book number six. Written by Felicity Heaton and narrated by Eric G. Dove. Chapter 29. 67 hours, 14 minutes, and 22 seconds had passed since Karis had placed a veil on the wraith using his shadows. 67 hours, 14 minutes, and 23 seconds in which he hadn't slept. 67 hours, 14 minutes, and 24 seconds in which Eli hadn't uttered a damned word. Karis loomed over the demon they had locked in Escher's cage in a separate building on the mansion grounds, staring down at him where he dared to sleep. Sleep. His head canted to his left, green gaze assessing, hunger igniting. Hunger to reach between the heavy enchanted bars of the cage and drag the fiend kicking and screaming up from his slumber. Fatigue blurred his thoughts together into a pleasing stream of bloodshed, a thousand outcomes that flickered before his eyes. Kiris? The soft voice belonging to the sorceress invaded his thoughts, purging them from his mind, leaving it blank by the time he looked across at her where she stood in the doorway, diamond right behind her. His brother kept a close eye on him, a wary edge to his gaze and his posture. He was contemplating whisking Cassandra away from him. Had she told Diamond that he had threatened her? He doubted it. He looked into her eyes, seeking the answer there, and she tensed, the briefest tightening of her shoulders that drew a reaction from his brother. Diamond wrapped an arm around her and ushered her into the room. Her confidence returned in a heartbeat, silver stars sparking in her eyes as she narrowed them on Karis. We came to relieve you. Ares orders. You need to eat. Diamond kept his distance from Karis kept Cass firmly away from him. But she hadn't told him. It was there in his eyes. She had kept their conversation to herself. Most probably a good thing. If Diamond knew he had threatened her, his brother would want his head. It was right there in his pale blue eyes as they glittered with ice, on the verge of turning white, that dangerous possessive side of their blood rearing its ugly head. He scoffed. That side of his blood was poison. It caused him nothing but agony. If he could cut it out of him, he would. His right hand twitched with the urge to lift to his chest, to sink claws into his flesh and remove the thing responsible for pumping that poison around his system. Something he was better off without. He didn't need a heart. Cassandra and Diamond stared at him, waiting. Get some rest, Diamond said. His words carefully weighed, his gaze cautious. Karis inclined his head and walked to the door, paused there to look back at the sorceress. Keep him cloaked. She must have heard the thinly veiled threat in his voice because her spine stiffened and fire lit her eyes. I know how to do this spell, thank you. It will not fail. When she looked as if she might strike him, he found himself lingering. His cheekbone heated with the memory of the blows she had delivered to it, dealing pain that had surprised him and caught him completely off guard. He knew she had seen one of his deepest, darkest secrets at that moment. His gaze flickered to Diamond, another thing she hadn't told his brother. Perhaps the sorceress wasn't so bad after all. She was strong, capable, and as much as it sickened him to say it, it was clear she felt something for Diamond. All six of his brothers made it. He pondered that as he walked away, heading for the main house across the moonlit garden. If oblivion claimed him now, he could rest easy knowing they weren't alone. No, he couldn't. He still had a duty to fulfill. Once it was done, so was he. He couldn't go on like this. Shadows wrapped around him, cloaking him from the world just long enough that he could slide a pill from the box in his pocket and place it on his tongue. The effect was instantaneous, cold washing through him, spreading to erase the poison that coursed in his veins and stealing some of his fatigue with it. The shadows dissipated as he stepped up onto the wooden walkway that led to the bathhouse. Ares leaned with his back against the stone wall of the showers, his long legs crossed at the ankle, his black jeans and t-shirt making him blend in with the night. The sparks of fire that danced in his dark eyes gave him away. There you are. Ares' deep growl rolled over him. 
Thought for a moment I was going to have to come and get you myself. Kara stopped level with him and looked across at him. The wraith will not speak. Ares shook his head, his wild tawny hair brushing his broad shoulders. Doesn't mean I'm going to let you go poking around in his head. It's too dangerous, Karis. You're too tired from having to cloak the bastard. If you tried to read his memories... Karis held his right hand up and Ares fell silent. He knew the risks. Eli was a strong demon, an old demon. He would be able to resist Karis's mind probe, and there was a chance it would drain Karis further, leaving him vulnerable. But they were getting nowhere. He had spent the last three days torturing the demon, doing everything short of looking into his mind to get the answers he wanted. Iko had even tried to read the demon, but the male's mind had blocks in place. Whatever Karis tried, Eli withstood it all, refusing to break. Unlike his body, Karis had broken bones, must have fractured every one in the demon's body at some point, and had stood by as Cassandra had used spells to put him back together tearing agonized screams from him that Karis's shadows had greedily absorbed. Cal had even taken a shot at the demon, intent on making him pay for what had happened to their sister. His youngest brother had revealed a dark streak as black as Karis's own one, had reveled in using his power over air to choke the demon, suffocating him and pushing him close to dying more than once. Cal was hungry for another go at the demon. All of his brothers were but Karis was determined to be the one to make him speak. The only path left open to him was cracking the demon's mind open. Ares remained hot on his heels as he strode into the main room of the mansion. Iko was coming out of the kitchen to his right as he entered, a tray of food clutched in her hands. The petite raven-haired woman paused and nodded at him. Esha is looking brighter today. Cass helped me clean him. He could see the relief that gave her, even felt a glimmer of it himself the barest tint of comfort that was there and gone in the blink of an eye as the pill erased it. That's good. He managed to layer relief into those two words, knowing she would want to hear it. She smiled and bobbed her head again before continuing across the long living room, passing the low wooden dining table where the others sat, and then the couches that formed the TV area at the other end of it. She disappeared around the corner and he caught a glimpse of her through the open panels to his left as she hurried along the covered wooden walkway heading for Escher's room. He felt Ares' gaze on the back of his head, was deeply aware of the others as they stared at him. Was he meant to say something? About Iko, about Escher, about the demon? He was too tired. Karis sank to his backside in an open spot at the long table and stared at the empty plate and bowl set before him. Ares was kind enough to fill them for him, although load them up might have been a more appropriate choice of words. When his plate was overflowing with meat and vegetables, and his bowl held a mound of rice so high that it was in danger of toppling over, he looked at his brother. Ares eased into the seat opposite him and hefted his broad shoulders in a shrug. You need to eat. Karis stared at the food. None of it appealed to him. He was hungry for answers, not sustenance. He picked at the food, though, eating small mouthfuls to appease Ares and get his brother off his back. If he didn't eat, Ares would dog him until he gave up. The others would make a fuss. He wanted them all gone, busy with other things, their eyes no longer on him. Megan swayed to her right and leaned against Ares' shoulder, a sigh escaping her as she rubbed her belly. I'm so full, but she wants more. Ares chuckled and covered her hand with his. <laughs> She has my appetite. They had recently discovered the baby was a female, not a male as they had been expecting. That news had been enough to place several of his brothers on edge. It had placed him on edge too. None of them wanted what had happened to Calindria to happen to another female in their family. He cursed them Warai for making the child female. Females were vulnerable, weaker than males. An image of Enyo flashed across his mind soared a silver arc as she gracefully cut through a horde of enemies, her moves more like a well-choreographed dance than a fight. She spun and dropped, the black leather pieces of her skirt lifting upwards as she hit the ground and rolled. Her onyx hair flowed behind her as she came onto her feet in a lightning-fast move, the silver plates on her armor flashing as they caught the bright sunlight. She decapitated the warrior she faced and twisted, soft green eyes bright with the high of battle. 
Perhaps not all females were weaker and more vulnerable than males. Karis dropped his head and rubbed his temples, harder and harder, trying to purge thoughts of her. Emotions tangled inside him, had him shaking with a need to reach into his pocket and seek the calm oblivion of another pill. It was getting harder to stop the feelings from coming. Karis, Megan murmured, concern in her tone. He shook his head, hoping to stop her before she could ask him what was wrong, before she could show more feelings for him that would only stir emotions in response. I am just tired. He pushed to his feet and didn't miss the way Ares looked at the food he had barely touched. Hoping to fend off his brother before he could make a fuss, he smiled tightly. I will eat more later, once I have slept and am feeling better. Ares continued to stare at him, a calculating edge to his sharp gaze, and then he gave a slight nod. Fine, but I'm holding you to that. Karis drifted away from them, the sound of the conversation that surged to life the moment he was out of sight, drifting into the background as he trod the well-worn boards of the walkway. Thankfully, Cassandra had vacated his room, moving into Diamond's one instead. He eased the panel that acted as a door open and then slid it closed behind him, turned towards it, kneeled. He rested his palms on his thighs, closed his eyes, and waited. It wasn't long before the house fell silent and still. He focused his senses, sharpening his internal radar until he could pinpoint everyone. They were all in their rooms, all except Diamond and Cassandra. Karis pushed to his feet, shook it off when he wobbled a little, fatigue rolling over him, and opened the door of his room. Cool air kissed his skin as he stepped out onto the walkway and cloaked himself in shadows, moving stealthily past the other bedrooms in the south wing of the house. When he reached the separate building that contained Escher's cage and the demon, he let the shadows dissipate and pushed the wooden door open. You look like shit, Diamond muttered as he glanced at him, lifting his gaze away from Cassandra. I am fine, fed and rested. You two should do the same. He looked at the demon who was still sleeping, curled up on the bottom of the square cage. Anything? Diamond shook his head. It's like he's hibernating. Conserving his strength. Karis ran an assessing gaze over the wraith, from his black hair over his tattered long black robes to his bare feet. Go. I will watch him. I doubt he will wake any time soon. He was going to wake. Karis was going to wake him. He schooled his features as Diamond studied him, not allowing his younger brother to see his intent. You sure? You don't want company? Diamond looked reluctant to leave. His brother was suspicious, and he wasn't the only one. The sorceress looked as if she didn't believe him either. Do not make me issue an order, Diamond. Karis eased down onto one of the benches that lined the walls of the square building. For a moment, Diamond looked as if he might, but then he jerked his chin towards the door. Come on, Cass. Let's see if anyone left us some food. Diamond issued him a black look as Cass swept past him, pausing for a second before following her out into the fading night, leaving him alone with Eli. Karis's green gaze slid to the sleeping demon. Shadows rose from the ground and snapped at the cage rattling it as they tried to pierce the barrier that surrounded the enchanted metal. Eli shot to his knees in the center of the cage, violet eyes darting to the shadows. He jerked left and right as those shadows lashed at the cage, rocking away from whichever side of the bars had been hit. Karis leaned forwards and rested his elbows on his knees as he folded his hands together. The demon looked at him and hissed, flashing fangs. Karis slowly smiled to reveal a hint of his own emerging fangs. The wraith stiffened, realization dawning in his eyes a split second before he tried to back away from Karis. His spine met the cold metal bars of the cage, and he tossed a fearful look at them and then Karis. Karis's smile widened as their eyes locked. The world dropped away, everything familiar to him blurring into nothingness. Something pushed back against him. Karis gritted his teeth and resisted it, drew down a breath and focused all of his will on breaching that barrier that stood between him and what he wanted. Pain splintered across his skull in agonizing waves that seemed to steal more of his strength with each one that washed over him. His breath shortened as he leaned forwards, as he peered harder into the darkness, 
determined to shatter it. He was a master of shadows, and they would obey him. He flinched and grunted as heat speared his mind, as his teeth ached and darkness writhed within him, snarled and gnashed its fangs at the threat before him. Karis pushed it all back down inside him, shoved aside the fear and the pain, and tried again, pressing forwards into the darkness. Eli whimpered, a pathetic sound. From the darkness, a new place constructed itself, greenery rising to tower over him as blue and white tiles fell into position around a fountain, and golden dirt rolled across the ground beneath his feet. Seville. A female lay before him, eyes fixed on him in a sightless stare. Lisabetta. Anger rolled through Karis, fury that stole his breath and had him wanting to lash out. He lifted his head and glared at the ones responsible for her death. His brothers. Karis growled and pushed past the memory, seeking another. When it was one of Lisabetta again, he sought another. This one had the female demon on her knees before him, naked and smiling. Karis tore it down and cast it aside, sought another. Cold trickled down his spine and his hands shook as he flipped through the memories of the female demon, following them deeper, sifting through layers and layers of them. Eli was using them to hide the information Karis wanted. He was sure of it. The wraith was resisting him. Karis dropped to his knees and gripped the bars of the cage, rattled it as he snarled at the demon it contained. Muscles clamped down on his bones, his limbs trembling as he leaned hard against the cage, pushed deeper into Eli's mind. Pain racked him, fire that devoured every inch of him as shadows twirled around his limbs and dragged him deeper still, under the next wave. He pushed through it, dived deeper and deeper, tearing down the memories of Lisabetta, racing back through time. Jagged black lines spread across his eyes, forming fault lines like lightning that forked in all directions. He caught a glimpse of a mansion, European, then another memory, this one a building that looked more American. He tried to focus on it, but the black lines were spreading too rapidly, obscuring too much of it, and it was gone before he could seize hold of it and watch the memory play out. He spun into the next one, bile rising up his throat as his entire body ached and his muscles turned to water. Darkness surrounded him, not darkness caused by the fault lines. Karis stood on a bluff, cold air buffeting him, his eyes fixed on the valley below him and a small village, fixed on two golden-haired children where they hid behind a boulder. His targets. Pain lanced him, straight through his heart as he recognized them. Callistos and Calindria. He tried to stay with the memory, but it fractured and shattered, crumbling around him as another one replaced it. A beautiful blonde female. She was slow to come into focus. He pushed through the pain that seared him to piece together the memory. A cage shimmered into being around her, suspended by a thick chain from the roof of a cavern. Black rock blended with the darkness in all directions, making it impossible to pick out any details, other than her blonde hair. And tattered scraps of sky-blue material that hugged her curves, looked as if she had pieced them together from a garment that had been too small for her womanly frame. He stilled as a huge male dressed only in leather pants trudged towards her, as she noticed him and backed into the corner of her cage that was furthest from him, causing it to sway. Couldn't breathe as she shook her head, her blue eyes pleading the meaty warrior. The male flexed fingers around a spear tipped with a black blade, crusted with blood. Karis fought to move, snarled and struggled when his feet refused to cooperate. He looked down at them at the jagged black shadows snaring his legs, creeping up them, devouring him. He had pushed too far. He lifted his head and looked at the woman, swore she looked right at him as the male drove the spear towards her. As she screamed, Kara screamed with her. The shadows engulfed him. Chapter 30 Diamond stepped the moment the harrowing scream cut through the night air landing in the building where he had left Karis. Karis gripped the bars of the cage, his eyes locked with the demons, his fangs long and irises black as he unleashed another pained bellow. Diamond grabbed him by his shoulders and tore him away from the cage, shattering the connection between him and the demon. 
His brother hit the floor in a sprawl and Diamond's heart hammered in his throat as he crouched to check on him, fearing the worst. Ares and Callistos appeared in the doorway. Cal was quick to reach Karis and feather his fingers over his neck, his sigh saying it all as it escaped his lips and he sank back onto his haunches. Relief washed through Diamond and through Ares too, judging by the way his shoulders sagged, the tension draining from him. Ares raked his hands over his tawny hair and stared at Karis, his dark eyes lit with golden red sparks. What the fuck did he think he was doing? I told him not to fucking do this. Ares hadn't been the only one to lay down the law with Karis either. Diamond had told him the same thing, and so had the rest of his brothers. Karis had agreed he wouldn't probe the demon's mind, and then he had gone ahead and done it anyway. It wasn't like Karis to be reckless. Valen and Merrick appeared beyond Ares and Cal, Katarina and Ava in tow. What the hell happened? Valen looked at Karis, his golden eyes bright. He stooped, his violet hair falling forwards to obscure his face as he grabbed hold of Karis and helped Cal get him onto the nearest bench. Karis remained deathly still. Valen cast a worried look at Merrick and Ares. He's gonna be all right, yeah? Ares didn't look sure, but he nodded anyway. Escher charged into the room, knocking Ares and Merrick aside, Iko hanging off his left arm. The petite female gave up trying to hold him back as Diamond stepped into his path, quickly obscuring his view of Karis. Good to see you up and about, Diamond said, keeping his voice calm and letting none of his fear show in it. What happened to him? That growled question had everyone looking at the cage at the demon who sat in the middle of it, hugging his knees and rocking, babbling incoherent things to himself. Gods, he wasn't sure what he would do if Karis had suffered the same fate. His mind fractured. The tension suddenly washed from the air as Karis's deep voice rolled over it. Diamond stepped back and twisted to face his brother. Karis curled over, dug his fingers into his black hair, and clutched the sides of his head as he slowly breathed. And you? Ares snapped. You break your own fucking mind, too? Karis lifted bleak green eyes to Ares, but didn't say a word, which wasn't reassuring. Ares took a hard step towards Karis, heat shimmering over his body as fire raged in his eyes. I fucking told you not to do it. Karis dropped his gaze back to the floor and closed his eyes, his voice thick with fatigue as he said, We were getting nowhere. Diamond glanced at Escher, checking on him as his brother began to breathe harder and faster. Escher? Escher's dark blue eyes snapped to him and he blinked, his breaths coming more slowly again. I want answers. I wanted... Diamond knew what his brother had wanted. He had wanted to be the one to break the wraith. He had needed to be the one to get them answers. But Karis had beaten him to it and he wasn't happy about it. Diamond looked at the demon although he wasn't sure what answers Karis had managed to get from him. One thing he did know, they wouldn't be getting any more. Eli was a mess, babbling strange things as he rocked, his violet gaze unfocused. Escher went to take a step forwards, darkness emerging in his eyes, and Diamond stood his ground. When Escher dragged his gaze away from the demon and narrowed it on him, Diamond lifted his right hand and hovered it over his bare shoulder offering comfort in the only way he could and hoping it would be enough to calm his brother. Crimson ringed his brother's sapphire irises as he snarled, I wanted answers. I was patient, Diamond. Patient. I wanted answers. I brought him here. I... Diamond inched closer to Escher. You did good. You did what was right. He didn't glance at Karis, but Karis's gaze landed on him and Diamond knew his oldest brother had read between the lines, and knew Diamond thought he had done wrong. Hell, it was obvious everyone thought he had been out of his mind to attempt to read the demon's memories. There wasn't a single person in the room who thought Karis had been right to do it. Escher breathed harder, his chest straining with each one as he stared straight through Diamond, as if he could see the demon on the other side of him. Escher, he whispered, we can still get answers. He wasn't sure how, though. Eli certainly wasn't going to be giving them any information. Escher hadn't needed this. Diamond could only imagine how difficult it had been for him to convince himself to capture the demon rather than kill him, to bring him back here for them to question rather than torturing him for answers in the underworld. 
now that battle had been for nothing, and Escher was dangerously close to slipping back into the darkness of his other side. The crimson invading his brother's eyes began to spread, and Diamond motioned to Iko. She hurried forwards and took hold of Escher's arm, slipped her hand into his right one, and smiled when Escher looked down at her. His brother blinked as she stroked his arm, and Blue began to win against the scarlet in his irises. Maybe we shall get some air, Iko breathed, her voice steady and no trace of nerves in her eyes. Even when Diamond knew she had to be afraid of losing Escher to his other side again, Escher's brow furrowed, his gaze darting between her and the cage, and he made a pained sound, as if having to choose between obeying Iko and pleasing her, and unleashing his rage on the demon was killing him. Get some air, Diamond whispered. I can come with you if you want. Escher swallowed, hesitated, nodded. Did you get anything out of him? Merrick eased into the room, allowing Megan to reach Ares and blocking Escher's path. Megan hesitated as she reached for Ares' hand. His older brother noticed her at last and paced away from Karis, heading out into the night. Megan trailed after him. She would get his brother's mood back under control, but Diamond wasn't sure it would stop Ares from tearing Karis a new one. Calindria, Karis whispered just as Diamond had been about to escort Escher out for some air, too. Everyone fell silent, an air of expectation settling over the room. Karis buried his face in his hands and his back shuddered as he inhaled. I saw her. All grown up. Locked in a cage. Somewhere in the underworld. A hellish domain. She's grown up? Cal sank to his knees in front of Karis. How is that possible? A soul doesn't grow up, does it? Cal looked at Merrick. Merrick shrugged. It shouldn't, but we don't know the particulars of what the Wraith and the Necromancer did to her soul. She can feel everything, Karis murmured, and everyone looked at him. Cold slithered down Diamond's spine as Karis continued. She can feel it, as if she's flesh and blood. I saw it. That can't be right. Cal's voice hitched, breaking as he threw a panicked look at everyone before settling his stormy blue eyes back on Karis. It has to be a lie. Something he showed you to hurt you. It has to be a lie. The demon couldn't enter the underworld until he went through the gate, and Escher was on his tail the whole time. So he couldn't have been there because Escher would have seen her too and she couldn't have been grown up like me. Merrick placed a gentle hand on Cal's shoulder. She's been dead a long time, Cal. It's possible the Wraith saw her when she was grown, long before we were sent to the mortal world. He might have managed to slip into the underworld before. No. Kara spoke that word in a calm tone, but it seemed to crack like lightning, shaking the room. He lifted his head and looked at Cal. I don't think it was a memory belonging to the Wraith. I think it belonged to the Necromancer. Eli took his blood? Diamond didn't want to believe that. Maybe. It wasn't Eli. It was someone else's memory. Kara scrubbed a hand over his face, sat up and leaned back, sagging against the wall as his hands fell into his lap. It was real, though. You think it was recent? Diamond flicked a glance at Cal, keeping an eye on him. His youngest brother stared straight ahead and looked as if he was struggling, his eyes wide and unfocused. Diamond had his hands full with keeping Escher on the rails. He wasn't sure he could handle both Escher and Cal going off them. I'm not sure. Karis pushed forwards and took hold of Cal's shoulders, and Cal looked at him. We will find her. Cal nodded, the movement jerky. When he didn't stop nodding, Karis needed his shoulders. Don't think about it for now, Karis murmured, fatigue laced with concern in his deep voice. I shouldn't have told you. Cal shook his head this time. No, I want to know these things. He might want to know them, but he was having trouble handling them without passing out. His brother's affliction had been slowly improving over the past few weeks. Since they had dealt with the necromancer and Cal had discovered that Calindria's soul was still out there, giving him a chance to save it and guide it to the Elysian fields where she could rest. 
He had managed to remember some things about what had happened to him and Calindria all those centuries ago without passing out. That's not good. Merrick's bass voice rolling over the room had everyone looking at him, and then in the direction of his gaze. Black blood trickled from Eli's nose and ears. The wraith stilled, rubbed his fingers over his lip and brought it away, staring at the blood. He smiled and then coughed, spraying more blood across the floor. It rolled down his chin and coated his teeth as he looked at Karis. This isn't over, Eli calmly said and coughed again, sending more vile black blood oozing down his chin. His violet eyes brightened dangerously as he stared hard at Karis, his voice dropping to a hiss. I am not the last. The wraith lurched forwards, vomiting blood his entire body shaking so hard he rattled the cage as he clawed at the bars on the floor of it, hands slipping around in the oily black liquid. Cass! Diamond leaped over Cal and shoved past Merrick, hitting the doorway of the building as quickly as he could. Need a healing spell. Cass twisted away from Mari, Megan, and Ares. Her eyes widened and she hurried to him. God's damn it, Karis! Ares boomed and rushed after her. Diamond looked back at Eli. Too late. The demon lay in a pool of his own blood, his eyes fixed on nothing. He was gone. Escher roared and grabbed the cage, shaking it hard, as if that would revive the dead demon. Aiko tried to calm him, clinging to his arm and speaking to him in Japanese, fear and panic written across her face as she kept her eyes locked on Escher's profile. Ares leveled a black look on Karis, accusation in it that had Karis lifting his green gaze to him. Karis's eyes darkened, a warning in them to his second-in-command, one that was apparently enough to have Ares backing down. Ares huffed and scrubbed a hand over his tawny hair, mussing it as his fiery gaze shifted to the dead demon. Damn it, he muttered, echoing the feeling Diamond had as he looked at the wraith. Karis had pushed too far, and now their shot at getting valuable information from the demon was gone. It wasn't like Karis to be so impatient. He looked back at his brother, trying to figure out what was wrong with him recently. Karis refused to meet his gaze, pushed to his feet, and strode out into the waning night. The wraith's final words rang in Diamond's mind. They knew there were others on the enemy's side, but it still felt like an ominous announcement. The Arinis were still alive, and if the two females had their way and got their hands on Cass, Escher would probably get his wish too. Eli would be alive again reanimated by the enemy and Cass's dark magic. Diamond fixed his senses on her as she came to stand beside him, needing to know that she was safe. He would keep her that way. He wouldn't let anything happen to her. Escher stiffened, locking up tight. What's wrong? Diamond went to him and hovered his hand over his brother's back. Escher didn't take his eyes off the demon, didn't move a muscle. Penitence, Escher whispered. Nemesis was summoning him for punishment. Diamond couldn't imagine what kind of torment he would receive as retribution for all the rules he had broken. Escher wouldn't be strong enough to survive it, not without losing himself to his other side again. I'll go, Diamond said, and stepped before Escher could stop him. Chapter 31 Diamond landed beneath a dim shaft of light, surrounded by infinite darkness. He peered through the weak light, hating the way it stole his vision, making it hard to see into the shadows. He wasn't alone. From those shadows, a haughty feminine voice echoed. You are not the one I summoned. But I am the one you'll punish. Diamond stood his ground when a delicate foot clad in a blood-red sandal emerged from the darkness followed by a soft sway of layers of sheer black fabric. Nemesis's scarlet eyes drilled into his face as she sashayed from the shadows, her face a placid mask that gave away none of her feelings. Her eyes revealed them all. She wasn't happy that he had taken Escher's place. So loyal to your brother, she murmured and banked right, skirting the edge of the light, her gaze assessing him as it raked over him sending a cold shiver down his spine. I always did love that about you, Diamond. He shuddered at the sound of his name uttered on her vile lips. 
He wanted to tell her to get on with things and announce the punishment he would receive for his brother's apparent crimes. But he knew better than to rush her. Rushing her normally ended with her doubling the punishment. He preferred to keep the number of lashes in the four digits area, not push them into five. He tracked her with his senses as she moved behind him, aware that moving would be a mistake. He had to endure this leisurely perusal of him, even if the feel of her eyes on him sickened him. She had always enjoyed tormenting him like this, always pointed out how handsome she found him, had even gone so far as propositioning him once. Because the bitch was aware that in this world, the underworld, his ice was no longer a problem, and he could touch without hurting someone. She played on that, fought to goad him into surrendering to his base needs and letting them get the better of him, slaking a thirst for physical contact that he was denied in the mortal realm. It was just another form of punishment. She appeared to his right and he slid his gaze that way, tracked her as she moved around him and concealed the shudder that racked him as she licked crimson lips. Beneath the sheer layers of her onyx robe, her nipples beaded. When she raked her gaze down him this time, it remained at his feet. Diamond looked down at the thick metal ring just a few inches in front of his boots. Metal of the gods. He cursed that infernal ring, recounting all the times he had been bound to it, how it never moved even when he thrashed and tried to break free of it. He swallowed and dropped to his knees before it, sucked down a fortifying breath as he held his hands out to it. Let's not rush. Nemesis drifted into the beam of light, and it reflected off the gold filigree that formed a corset over her stomach, cinching the black layers of her dress in to reveal her curves. Cold skated over his flesh as she ran her hand over his shoulders, and he closed his eyes as she crouched behind him, her fingers easing down his spine. We would not want to bloody this. She stroked the hem of his top, and he dutifully lifted his arms above his head as she pulled it up. There's a good boy. He scowled at her over his shoulder when she finished removing his top. She leaned towards him, her crimson hair brushing his bare skin, her breath cold against his ear as she whispered, Now, now, best keep that temper in check, lest I decide a different sort of punishment for you. She skimmed her palms across his shoulders and her hands shook as she sucked in a trembling breath. He didn't want to imagine the vile things she was contemplating, tried to shut them and the sudden spike of fear that lanced him out of his mind. She wouldn't violate him like that. The terms of his punishment were hers to set, but it would overstep a line and his father would have her head. She brushed her lips across his left shoulder. Diamond clenched his fists. She wouldn't. She chuckled into his ear. <laughs> so tense. I would have thought you would be more relaxed these days. He wanted to look at her and demand what she meant by that, but he knew the answer in his heart. She knew about him and Cassandra. Which was strange. She had never taken an interest in any of their lives before now. He had never realized she could see such things from her domain in the underworld. Rich brown leathers snapped around his wrists and jerked him forwards as the straps attached themselves to the heavy metal ring. Nemesis stroked two fingers down his spine and murmured, How many lashes are adequate punishment for breaking an exile, entering the underworld without permission, and murdering hundreds of people here in your father's domain? Diamond really didn't want to know the answer to that. I would have given Escher twenty thousand at the very least. Diamond closed his eyes and bowed his head fighting the urge to ask her to give him less than that, to use the attraction she felt towards him to bargain with her. Her lips feathered across his ear. Perhaps ten thousand? Gods, that was still too many. A few thousand with her barbed metal whip was bad enough, always had him close to blacking out. Part of the terms of penitence was that he had to remain awake for it all to utter an apology, one for each lash of her whip. She would be forced to wait for him to heal and wake again, and would no doubt increase the number of lashes, keeping him here in her realm for longer and longer. She loosed a soft moan as she caressed his shoulders, as she lowered her hands down his back and then under his arms. 
Her breast pressed against his back, and he bit his tongue as she raked nails over his bare chest. It has been so long since I have been with a man, she whispered into the shell of his ear. No. Diamond jerked backwards as much as he could with his hands bound to the ring, attempting to dislodge her. She chuckled and nipped at his earlobe. Would you really get a say if I decided your punishment would be to service me? He wouldn't, but someone else would. Father would have your head. She sighed. Unfortunately, that is true. Fifteen thousand lashes it is. Fifteen. He twisted his head towards her, his cheek colliding with her lips. You said ten. You were insolent. She pressed a kiss to his cheek and edged backwards, rose onto her feet and rounded him, standing so close that he had to tilt his head back and look up at her to keep his eyes on hers, just the way she liked it. She liked having him and his brothers on their knees, at her mercy. Kiss me and I will have that number. He scowled at her. No. She inspected her nails, a dark edge to her crimson eyes. So loyal to your little sorceress. She has you well under her spell. He wanted to ask her what that was supposed to mean too, but held his tongue, because there was no mistaking the emotion that surfaced in her eyes as they shifted back to lock with his. She was jealous. He lowered his gaze to the metal ring and his bound hands, focused on it instead of her, hoping she would get the message that he was done talking. He could see where things would go if he let her have her way. She wanted to turn him against Cass, would probably say anything to get him to break up with her, spouting lies about her that were bound to involve his enemy and her being a member of them. Cass wasn't. She was loyal, too, loyal to Mari and to him. The gritty black floor bit into his knees through his jeans as he waited. Seconds stretched into minutes. Nemesis finally huffed. A whir cut the thick air and he gritted his teeth, adrenaline coursing through him as he braced himself. He grunted as the metal whip cut down his back, catching his spine, muttered his first apology. She struck him again, forcing another from him, and then again, this one catching him from his left shoulder all the way down to his right hip. He arched forwards, barely stifling the cry that rose up his throat, apologized again. Diamond tried to keep count of the lashes as she hit him over and over, focused on Cass to help him bear the pain of each strike, filling his mind with something pleasant to counter the torment. But the pain began to win, blurring his thoughts as his entire body ached, heat throbbing across his back and his shoulders in sickening waves as blood rolled down his skin and drenched his jeans. As sweat stung the lacerations, Nemesis stopped. They weren't done. His head was a little foggy and it was near impossible to focus, but he swore she had only delivered 2,000 lashes. Was she giving him a breather? It wasn't like her. She had whipped him close to 4,000 times once without giving him a break. He grimaced and clenched his teeth as she drew her fingers across his shoulders, fire rolling in their wake as she caught each deep laceration. She rounded him and he looked up at her, found her staring at her fingers, at his blood a distant look in her crimson eyes. Such power in something so... She didn't finish that sentence, just lifted her fingers to her lips and tasted his blood, her tongue darting over her fingertips. Her eyes rolled back and she moaned. That was a first. She had never tasted his blood before. He frowned at her, a glimmer of suspicion forming inside his weary mind pushing through the pain and the fatigue that racked him. Her gaze dropped to meet his. She seemed strangely upbeat. He would go as far as saying she was a little giddy about something. It wasn't there on the surface on her placid features, but it was there in her eyes as she towered over him. Something was wrong, very wrong. Nemesis leaned over, her breast threatening to spill from her black dress, and stroked his cheek. Diamond stared into her eyes. Can we get on with this? I have somewhere I need to be. He knew he was pushing it, but he wanted to be away from her, far away from her. Something wasn't right about her today. 
She was always strange, but she had never tasted his blood before and had never been like this. Was it because of Cass or something else? That feeling that it was about something else only worsened as she smiled. As she peered deep into his eyes, a sick, satisfied edge to hers. Oh, sweet diamond, you're not going anywhere, she murmured, voice dripping honey even as it sent ice skating down his spine. He reared back, breaking contact between them, and frowned at her. What do you mean by that? Her crimson smile only widened. A change of plans, but perhaps for the better. She raked her scarlet eyes over him, twisted satisfaction and darkness filling them. It is such a shame I cannot be there to see your downfall. She leaned in close and hissed in his ear. But I will be here to welcome you with open arms when you return to my underworld. Diamond stared at her, too stunned to say anything as he realized she was with the enemy. He needed to warn his brothers, but he didn't think he was going to get the chance. He wrestled against the restraints anyway, desperately trying to break them. If he could break the leather straps, he could step back to Tokyo. His pulse pounded faster as the brown leather refused to give, as Nemesis smiled down at him. Two messengers appeared behind her, the black-haired males materializing out of the shadows, their mismatched one green and one blue eyes fixed straight ahead of them. Their black tunics bore silver detailing around the cuffs and fastenings. They served his family, or they had served it. Shock rolled through him as that revelation hit him, and he bit out a curse. The enemy had even managed to turn these two males, and the gods only knew how many others against his father. Never in all his years had he imagined a messenger would betray his family. Nemesis's hand drifted from Diamond's face. I will await your return, my beautiful slave. You will service me for eternity. She tilted her head slightly to her left. Take him. Chapter 32 Diamond blacked out at some point. When he came around, he was in some kind of loft apartment. Arched windows had been painted black, but as far as he could tell, it was daylight outside. He twisted on the dusty wooden floorboards, his muscles protesting as he maneuvered onto his side and realized his arms were bound behind his back. His vision wobbled, blurring and going dark around the edges before it cleared again. He shook his head, trying to shift the heaviness from it. He felt as if he had drunk a barrel of ambrosia. The room distorted again as he tried to take stock of his surroundings and figure out where he was being held. The exposed brick walls had been painted white at some point, but the paint was peeling now, and black mold crept across the ceiling from the top corner of the wall nearest the bank of windows. No furniture either. It looked as if no one had lived here in a very long time. Diamond rolled onto his front, pressed his left cheek into the floorboards, and pushed his backside up. He wriggled his knees forwards and gritted his teeth as he forced himself into an upright position. Someone shoved him in the back. He hit the floorboards face first and growled at the person. They weren't powerful, not demon either. He shuffled around so he could peer over his shoulder at them. The messengers. He glared at the one closest to him, the one who had shoved him, staring right into his mismatched eyes. My father know you're a traitor? The male's eyes brightened dangerously, one glowing emerald as the other shone like a sapphire. Diamond spat at his feet got a boot in the face as a reward. He grunted as he was flipped onto his back, his arms twisting painfully beneath him. The male looked ready to level another blow at him, stiffened. Now, I do believe we said not to harm him, the soft female voice echoed in the cavernous room. Diamond's gaze sought the owner of it, found her near a metal door a few meters south of his feet. Her blonde tresses had been twisted into a plate that arced over the front of her hair and her blue eyes were bright as she gazed at him, her rosy lips curling into the semblance of a smile. If he hadn't known better, he would have thought it was Marinda. But he did know better. He glared at the fury, letting her know exactly what he thought of her. Another traitor. The female didn't react, just kept walking towards him, her eyes never leaving him. Behind her, the second fury entered the room, sighing. 
We will not be able to do anything until nightfall, evening at the earliest. She didn't sound happy about that. Diamond was. It gave him time. His brothers would be concerned about him by now. Cass definitely would be. He wasn't sure how long he had been out, but he guessed it was a few hours, judging by how well the lacerations on his back had healed. His sorceress didn't seem to be able to let him out of her sight for more than a couple of hours, something he had lamented once but was thankful for now. Providing she hadn't changed that quirk of hers since she had staked a claim on his heart, she would be looking for him. He was sure of it. I thought New York in autumn was meant to be dreary. The first Irini smoothed her blonde hair, tracing each ribbon of the braid with both hands. She will not be pleased about the delay. A delay is necessary, the second responded as she moved around the room, giving the messenger who had remained at a distance a slow once over. She pressed close to him and tiptoed, whispering into his ear. Can you really not feel things? She feathered her fingers down the buttons of his tunic, and the way the male reacted when she palmed the front of his trousers said that he definitely could feel things. His mismatched eyes widened and darkened and edged towards her. Such a shame you don't serve me. She gently patted the male's groin. His pupils devoured the green and blue of his irises. Melody, the first fury snapped. Focus. Just trying to find a way to pass the time, Meadow. Marinda Melody Meadow. Three Irinies, goddesses of the underworld that formed a power circle that could be devastating if they put their mind to it and worked together. Thankfully, Marinda was on his side, weakening the other two Irinies. Melody sighed and dragged herself away from the male, coming to stand beside the woman who could have passed as her twin. They were even dressed the same, clad in black corsets and leathers that reminded him of Cass. But unlike Cass, both of them looked wary of getting too close to him. Because of his power? He focused it, keeping his gaze on their faces so they kept looking at him and not at the floor. I spread outwards from beneath him. Meadow was swift to notice and back away, catching Melody's arm and pulling her with her. The ice formed more rapidly to keep pace with them. And then it stopped. He frowned at the wooden floor and cursed. A crudely drawn chalk circle surrounded him, glyphs flowing around the outside of it. A ward. Both Irini's eyes changed, turning violet edged with black as they glared at him. Nemesis wants him kept alive. The messenger who Melody had groped stepped forwards, his eyes fixed on the female, hunger still shining in them. Melody's right eyebrow slowly arched as she looked him over and pursed her lips a sultry pout in his direction that had his eyes darkening further. Meadow huffed and glared at Diamond. We won't kill him. Just need to take a little blood. Blood. The Irinis could siphon powers from blood and had proven in Tokyo that it didn't need to be inside the host for that to happen. If they got their hands on his blood, they would be able to command the gate. One of the gates was bound to him in blood, too, and would easily do their bidding. He bit out a ripe curse, aiming this one at Karis. His oldest brother should have let him seal the New York gate when he had offered to do it. Now the enemy planned to use his blood to open it, and when it was fully formed and linked this world to the underworld, they would lock it open with the wards they knew. It could take hours, days, to discover which wards they had used through a process of elimination so he could close it again. In that time, the underworld and this realm would begin to merge. If he couldn't get it closed again, the merging of the worlds could damage the gate to the point where it would remain open no matter what he and his brothers tried to do, and the two worlds would slowly collide, causing catastrophic damage to both sides of the gate, forming a new realm. The mission he had been sent here to fulfill would end in failure. His home and his family would be destroyed. The enemy wouldn't settle for degrading his father by taking his throne from him. They would kill him and his mother. His brothers would most likely be hunted and slaughtered, too. And all their women. And Cass. He wouldn't let that happen. He narrowed his eyes on the two Furies, a battle sparking to life inside him as he thought about what he needed to do. He couldn't let them get their hands on his blood. Ice numbed his fingers as he considered what he was on the verge of doing. It would hurt his family, hitting his parents and Escher the hardest. Might even be too much for his brother in his current condition and Cass would be furious with him. But he couldn't let them get their hands on her, 
and he couldn't let the gate fall. Hurting everyone he loved was better than sentencing them to death. He pulled down a slow breath, fighting to steady his nerves, to muster the courage he needed, courage that kept slipping through his fingers. Diamond tilted his chin up. He had to do it. He would do it. He stared into Meadow's eyes. Let every drop of the hatred he felt towards her and his enemy shine in his eyes. Every drop of the rage he felt because they had forced his hand, but hid all the guilt and the pain, the remorse that threatened to devour him and shatter his strength. He was doing this. He was going to die here. Diamond focused on his hands, on his power, but rather than attacking, he turned it inward. His blood was quick to slow in his veins, the cold he always felt growing more intense as his head grew foggy, thoughts blurring together as tiredness rolled through his already weakened body. Panic sparked, throwing his mind and his heart into turmoil, and he clenched his hands into tight fists as he fought it, kept pushing onwards as his instincts roared at him to stop, that he would die if he kept going. That survival instinct battered him, had his ice waning even as he tried to keep it building inside him, spreading through him. He gritted his teeth and pushed through it, desperately shutting out the voice that screamed in his mind. His feet numbed as ice formed over them, slowly spreading up his calves. Darkness encroached at the corners of his mind, and he gasped for air as the cold invaded his lungs, as his heart slowed. He was drowning, drowning in his own ice. Momentary blackness washed over him and he tipped forwards, jerked backwards when it released him and shook his head. Stop him! Meadow barked as she lunged for him, her violet eyes wild. He couldn't let them do that. Ice formed jagged spikes around him, shooting up to the ceiling. The two furies battered it, fracturing and even breaking holes in it in places, but his power was running at full tilt now, was swift to repair any area that took damage. The walls surrounding him slowly turned pale blue as they thickened, inching towards him. They touched his knees first, met with the ice that had formed over them already. He struggled to breathe, what little air he could get into his burning lungs, fogging in front of his face as he expelled it. His teeth clattered, loud in his prison, as ice rolled up his stomach and arms, reached his shoulders, sapping the last of the heat from his body as it closed over his chest. His thoughts slowed, his vision dimming. Ice formed on his cheeks in the path of his tears as he thought of Cass. He wished he had taken a moment to speak with her before he had gone to Nemesis. Wished he had told her that he loved her. Had seen her face one last time. Said goodbye to her. Sorrow washed through him as he realized he would never see his beautiful Koldunya again. The last thing he felt as the ice enclosed him. He had finally found someone he truly loved and this time he was the one leaving her. Chapter 33 Cass stroked Mr. Milos, petting the white and ginger cat as she held him in her arms. He purred, the rumbling sound a comfort to her frayed nerves. She tried to focus on him to shut out that unsettling sensation burning inside her heart, but it lingered, tormenting her. Diamond had been gone too long. She kept running her right hand over Milos's fur as her bare feet carried her through the Tokyo mansion, towards the voices she could hear in the main living area of the house. Mari looked over the back of the cream couch, twisting away from Callistos to smile at Cass as she entered the room at the TV area end of it. Have you seen Diamond? Cass paused at the back of the couch. Callistos set the console controller down on his lap, looked at her and shook his head. When she looked at Valen, who lounged on the other couch, twirling a ribbon of his violet hair around his finger with one hand, and hammering at the controller he gripped with the other, the god of lightning gave a half-hearted shrug. Sometimes penitence is a bitch, Valen glanced at her, looking past Ava where the beautiful Italian assassin sat beside him, acting as his pillow as she cleaned a gun, their black fatigues making them blend together. Maybe he's chilling out in Hong Kong. Doesn't want you seeing how fucked up he is and going on a bender. That wasn't a comfort. She glared at him. Ava nudged him with her right arm and muttered, Stronzo. What? He shifted left so his head landed in her lap and pulled an innocent and hurt face. I was being helpful. You were being a dick, Cal put in, earning a glare from his brother. Cass's petting grew more frantic. Milos didn't care. 
he just purred harder, lapping up the attention. For once, he wasn't even bothered that Callistos was near him. Her cat had strange tastes. He adored Valen and Escher, and hissed near constantly at the rest of the brothers. Of course, he loved every single one of the women, the little Lothario. Someone stalked into the room to her right, striding from the corridor beside the kitchen. Escher. He ran an unsteady hand over his wild black hair, preening it over and over again as he hurried from the bathhouse, or perhaps the cage. She studied him. Judging by the conflicting feelings his blue eyes held, it had been the cage. Escher had been firmly on edge since coming around, and had almost gone over it when the demon had died. After Diamond had left, Escher and Karis had argued. Rain still poured down outside, creating a melody as it struck the roof of the mansion, a storm that didn't look as if it was going to clear up any time soon. Ares had tried to keep the peace between the brothers, but Escher was furious about what Karis had done, and Karis was unrepentant. So the argument continued. Karis strode in behind Escher, hot on his heels. We're done, Escher snarled, throwing a black look over his shoulder. Karis looked as if he wanted to say differently, but Iko ran around him, cutting him off, her pigtails and short black ruffled skirt bouncing with each rushed stride. She caught up with Escher and looped both of her arms around his right one. The feral god slowed and looked down at her, gradually coming to a halt as his face crumpled. He gathered her into his arms and buried his face in her neck, his inky hair blending with hers as he clutched her to him. Iko wrapped her arms around him and held him stroked his back through his dark gray shirt and whispered words to him in Japanese. He didn't need this shit, Ares muttered as he brought up the rear. I told you not to do anything. Karis shot him down with a glare, one that had darkness glittering in his green eyes. Ares looked as if he was chewing a wasp as he stomped past him, heading for the couches. Have you seen Diamond? She wasn't sure who she aimed that question at as she stroked Milos harder, her nerves getting the better of her again. Escher lifted his head and looked at her. He's not back? She shook her head. It's been hours, Ares muttered with a glance at the drenched garden. More like a day, Escher said and straightened, a look crossing his face that had Karis placing a hand on his shoulder. You're in no condition to step to Hong Kong. Karis's grip on his shoulder tightened briefly before loosening again, when Merrick pushed onto his feet on the other side of the low dining table. I'll go. The burly brunette glanced down at the pretty caramel-haired woman who paused at the keyboard of a laptop. Back in a minute. Keep searching. Katerina nodded and went back to her work as Merrick disappeared in a swirl of black smoke. Cass's gaze drifted to the garden beyond the walkway, focusing on Milos's purring rather than the tense silence that descended as everyone waited. She scratched Milos behind his ears, rubbed them, and tickled his chin. What was taking Merrick so long? Was Diamond seriously hurt and needed his help? She was on the verge of forming the spell to transport her to Hong Kong when Merrick finally reappeared in the middle of the room. He's not there. Merrick's earthy brown eyes held a lot of concern as he looked at her and only her, his expression so grave that she froze. Her breath hitched and heart lodged in her throat. What do you mean he isn't there? He's not there and there's no sign he's been there recently. Bed is made, everything is clean. No blood. The place is immaculate. Cass threw a glance at his brothers. Where can he be? Cal slowly stood, coming to face her, and she wanted to lash out at him when he murmured thoughtfully, What if he never came back? Not possible. Escher was quick to speak before she could, his eyes darkening to navy as he turned on Cal. Diamond went to pay penitence for me. Maybe it was more punishment than usual. Maybe he's still there. For twenty-four hours, she bit out, her temper fraying as she hugged Milos to her chest. It's possible, Escher retorted. The rest of his brothers looked as if it wasn't. They looked as if they felt the same way as she did. He was grasping at straws, clinging to hope that Cass couldn't feel as she stared at the garden, as that unsettling feeling condensed inside her into full-blown fear. Something had happened to Diamond. She looked at each of his brothers in turn. Karis's eyes verged on black as he twisted the silver band around his thumb. His jet eyebrows knitted hard and his lips compressed into a thin line. Ares looked equally as troubled, sparks of golden red lighting his brown irises. Valen looked ready to rip someone apart. You think the enemy might have managed to... 
She didn't want to finish that sentence. I think the enemy has been in our sights all this time, Ares growled, his face grim and fire raging in his eyes. She wasn't sure what he meant by that until Callisto spoke. Nemesis wouldn't turn against father, would she? He didn't look sure about that, his blue eyes turning stormy as he looked between Ares and Karis. Karis snarled. Anything is possible. I don't like the sound of this, Merrick put in. We need to send a messenger to father to ask whether he can feel Diamond in the underworld. While that's happening, we need to search for him. If he's not in Hong Kong and he's not here, maybe they took him to one of the old safe houses. We could check there. They took him to New York. Karis sounded certain of that. Everyone looked at Karis. Valen and Ava rose to their feet, giving him the whole of their attention, and Mari pushed to hers at the same time as Katerina stood and went to Merrick. The enemy attacked Hong Kong when Escher was absent. They know which gate is bound to each of us. Karis looked at Ares, Merrick, and then Valen. We head to New York. I'm coming too. Escher broke away from Iko, and outside the rain grew heavier again pelting the earth and filling the air with the scent of it. No. That single word fell hard in the room, spoken in a commanding tone that had Escher's shoulders stiffening as he leveled a glare on Karis. Karis didn't give him a chance to argue. You are in no fit state to step there, let alone fight. On a battlefield, you are a liability right now. I will not risk you. All of the fight fled from Escher's eyes as the last five words hit him uttered in a soft tone that had her and everyone else in the room judging by their faces, aware of the depth of Karis's feelings for his brother. Karis went to Escher, placed his hands on his shoulders, and looked deep into his eyes. I know you need to be there, Escher, because it's Diamond, but you are still recovering. You need to sit this one out. Escher's black eyebrows furrowed, pain dancing in his dark blue eyes as they darted between Karis's. A need to do something to ease him filled her, had her moving towards him to touch his back. The moment she made contact with him, he turned his face towards her. I'll go with them, she said in a low voice, one filled with the compassion she felt inside as she looked into Escher's eyes and saw the conflict in them, the need. The thought of sitting this one out was killing him. Karis was right, though. Escher was a liability. He couldn't go into battle, but she could and she would do it for both of them. I'll make sure he comes home. Escher nodded stiffly. We'll take care of the ladies, Cal said and came to Escher, slapping him on the back and nodded when Escher looked at him. Gotta keep Megan and the others safe, right? Escher's eyes rapidly darkened and he growled as he nodded. The babe. God's helped the world if Iko ever fell pregnant. The beast would probably coddle her to death and kill anyone who so much as looked in her direction. Ares looked as if he wanted to hug his brother for being so concerned about Megan and the baby, but settled for saying, Thanks. She'll feel better knowing you're both here. I'll kill any bastard who sets foot near here. Ava checked her gun was loaded, her sapphire eyes bright as she stared lovingly at it and then at Valen. You give them hell. Valen swept her up into his arms and kissed her. Always do. Something deep inside Cass ached. The need to see Diamond was safe and alive, burning more fiercely and flooding her with impatience. Let us go. Cass walked to Iko and handed Milos to her. Her bastard cat continued purring contentedly as Iko petted him, evidently uncaring about the change of hands. Traitor. Cass began to form the incantation in her mind, stopped when Ares towered over her. You stay here. She scowled at him. I will not. A few of his brothers looked as if they wanted to voice an objection, too, so she glared at them all, making sure they knew she was serious. It didn't matter that the enemy wanted to get their hands on her. All that mattered was bringing Diamond home safe. I know the risks, but none of you get a say. This is my decision, and no one can stop me from going. She planted her hands on her hips, digging her fingertips into her black leather trousers, and dared them all to speak. Callistos and Escher both looked as if they wanted her to go, probably for different reasons. Mari looked concerned but unlikely to say something. Valen looked bored. Merrick and Ares looked ready to argue with her about this. Karis. Well, he looked as if he was considering tossing her into the cage. So Cass played her trump card. She tipped her chin up. 
I can use a spell to locate Diamond. Merrick glanced at Ares. Ares huffed. You want to find Diamond quickly. You're going to need me. She glared at them all, stoked her magic so it shone in her eyes, making sure they were aware of the hell she would unleash on them if they tried to bench her this time. Karis's black eyebrows drew down. The first sign of trouble and you are off the field. I can live with that. She swept her fall of black hair over her shoulder and then held her hand out to Merrick. Shall we go? Wait. Ares looked at Escher as Cal went to the porch, grabbed everyone's shoes and tossed them at them. Ares shoved his feet into his boots. Summon a messenger and send it to father. Tell him to dispatch a legion to Nemesis's domain and secure her, just in case our hunch is right. We know she can't come here with the gates closed to traffic, so she has to be somewhere in the underworld. I'd rather she didn't get the chance to run. The moment Escher nodded, Ares and Karis disappeared. Valen followed them. Merrick took hold of her arm as she finished zipping up her calf-height leather boots and stepped with her, darkness embracing them for a heartbeat before it parted to reveal a shady corner of Central Park. The humans jogging along the pathway that cut through the enormous park in the heart of New York gave her and the gods at her back strange looks as they stepped out of the trees. She scowled at them all. She hadn't been up to any funny business in the bushes with four men, if that was what they were thinking. A few of the female joggers slowed, and one almost tripped over her feet as Karis stepped into the fading light, lifting a hand above his green eyes to shield them as he assessed the position of the sun. Ares shook his head. Valen sighed. I can practically see their panties melting away as they run past him. Cass looked at Karis. He was beautiful, but only on the surface. Beneath that perfect exterior beat a black, dead heart that was twisted with a need for pain. He would probably destroy any woman he came in contact with, sucking the light right out of them. The light is fading fast. We have perhaps an hour at most before the demons can walk in it. Karis turned his back on the women apparently not noticing or uncaring of the way they gawped at him. She supposed he had probably had females fawning over him his entire life, first in the underworld and now in the mortal one. We could wait until it gets dark, Valen put in, as he raked his fingers through the longer lengths of his violet hair, pushing it back from his face. The enemy is bound to want to hit the gate and bring Diamond with them. He drew a few glances from the women, too ones that rapidly turned to fear as they noticed the scar tissue that ran from the left side of his jaw down his neck. He glared at them, golden eyes dangerously bright. Might I remind you that the enemy can also draw the power to do just that from his blood? Cass snapped, fear getting the better of her again. She's right. Ares folded his arms, his biceps flexing beneath his tight black t-shirt as fire blazed in his dark eyes. We're not waiting leaving Diamond at their mercy. If the enemy even has him, might be a wild goose chase. Valen hiked his shoulders, lifting the hem of his own black t-shirt to flash a toned strip of stomach. Cass shut them out as they argued about what to do, pressed the fingers of her right hand to her chest and focused as she breathed. Each slow inhale and steady exhale cleared her mind, allowing her magic to come to the fore. It ran in her blood, a comforting presence, power at her fingertips the power to save the man she loved. She focused on that, on him, letting the magic rise inside her and latch on to that desire. It grew stronger, a heady sensation that had her swaying as it began to twine down her legs, twisting around them beneath her skin. The moment it connected with the grass beneath her boots, she tensed. Pain bloomed in her heart and she gasped. Something is wrong. She flicked her eyes open and looked at Ares, Karis, and then Merrick and Valen, that bad feeling growing inside her as her magic began to seep outwards, fingers of it stretching in all directions. I can feel it. I need to find Diamond now. Karis nodded. It's best we don't wait for the enemy to approach the gate. If we can get our hands on Diamond, we might be able to avoid the gate coming under fire. He looked at her. Can you sense him? She blinked and nodded. I think so. I'll try a spell. Cass pieced together the incantation, knitting several different locator spells together in an attempt to make the strongest one she could manage. All the while, the connection between her and nature grew, and the fear she felt grew stronger with it. She could sense the four gods around her so clearly, and sense that Diamond was in deep trouble. She wasn't sure how.
She had never experienced anything like this. Was it because they were born of Persephone's blood and therefore linked to nature? Their powers were all elemental, after all. It had to be the reason she could sense a disturbance where Diamond was concerned, felt as if something was terribly wrong. The whole balance of nature felt off in this area, and somehow she knew it was because something had happened to him. You think the enemy is going to try to use Diamond's blood to open the gate? Valen muttered. Most likely, Karis answered. What happens if they want his blood for more than just opening the gate? What if they intend to use him as a sacrifice? Merrick's voice speared her mind, fracturing her focus and scattering the pieces of the spell. Her gaze snapped to Karis. His green eyes slid to her and then back to his brothers. That would be bad. If they kill him, I doubt we would be able to seal the gate. There is a chance it would remain open. And the two worlds. This isn't helping, Cass barked and glared at them all. Just shut up and let me work. Her hands trembled and she shook them, trying to stop them. They continued to quiver as nerves rose inside her, fear at the helm, shaking her to her soul. Diamond had to be all right. He just had to be. She couldn't lose him. She closed her eyes and built the incantation again, forming the tracking spell as silence fell around her, and she banished her fears once more. Fear would only slow her down, and Diamond needed her. As the spell completed, she was instantly connected to everything around her, aware of the world in a way she had never felt before. Every living thing was outlined in the darkness of her mind, a strange echo of each natural object and person built by traces of light. Trees were glittering green silhouettes, water rippled blue, rocks shone gray. Humans moving past her were flickering pink outlines. The four gods watching her shimmered with different colors. Red, brown, purple, black. Cass pressed her hand to her heart and saw white. Her eyes scanned the darkness, seeking that absence of color, seeking ice. She walked forwards with her eyes closed, the spell revealing everything to her in flickers and bolts of light. We following her? Valen's voice warbled in her ears, a distant, watery sound. Cass sensed the power of the four gods buffeting her as they tracked her, keeping a few steps behind her. Their impatience washed over her, mingling with her own to keep her moving forwards, seeking the white. The sensation that something was wrong grew stronger, beating within her, and then weaker again. She backtracked, almost bumping into Ares. His heat washed over her as she moved around him, studying the feeling. It grew stronger again. Cass tracked it through glittering green fields and around shimmering blue water. When she neared the other side of the park, she slowed her steps her eyes lifting to scan the sky beyond the ancient trees. He's somewhere up there? Ares' deep voice echoed in her ears. She nodded, whispered, Somewhere. But all she could see were humans floating in the air, no shape of buildings. She moved beyond the park. Someone grabbed her arm and pulled her back as a car horn blasted. You crazy? Valen barked at her. Cass opened her eyes and they widened as she saw the steady stream of vehicles darting across the route ahead of her. They don't show up, she bit out defensively. I can see natural things, nothing more. Valen dragged her to the nearest crossing. Now I know that, I'll keep a better bloody eye on you. Diamond would kill us if anything happened to you. He's probably going to kill us for letting her come with us anyway, Ares muttered. She frowned at him. No one let me come. He just shrugged at that. She crossed the road and shirked free of Valen's grip and closed her eyes again. The spell burst back to life, outlining everything for her. She focused on Diamond again, following that feeling in her heart down a side street. She lifted her head and scanned the buildings around her, desperately hoping to see white. But all she saw was pink humans. This place looks familiar, Karis muttered. Whole damned world looks familiar these days, Valen grumbled back at him. Been here way too long. She frowned and stopped, backtracked a few steps, and looked up at the building to her right. That's strange. She canted her head at the shimmering forms. What's strange? Karis asked. Nothing, just those people have two colors. She pointed at them where they hovered high in the air, the only two people in the building. Two colors. Ares' gruff voice and the heat of him close to her had her looking at him. Fucking tell me they're not green and blue. A shiver chased down her spine and arms. She nodded. 
Ares growled, flashing short fangs, his eyes rapidly darkening. Bastards. She wasn't following. She looked at the others. Shock danced in Valen's golden eyes. You can't be serious. Merrick and Karis didn't look at all happy. When she looked back at Ares for an explanation, he bit out, Messengers. Maybe Dad found Diamond before us and sent them to save him? Valen didn't sound like he believed that. Fucking traitors, Ares barked and turned fiery eyes on her. Is Diamond there? Cass shook her head. I only saw... Cold washed through her. She closed her eyes and looked through the spell again. Looked more closely this time. Her heart hitched. Blood turned to sludge in her veins. There just beyond the two shimmering blue-green forms was the faintest hint of white, a towering rectangular block of it. Ice. No. She flipped her eyes open and summoned the spell, transported herself before the brothers could stop her. Chapter 34 Rage poured through Cass as she landed in a musty, empty loft apartment, fed by despair as her gaze landed on the block of pale blue ice before her. Diamond knelt in the middle of it, his arms bound behind his back. What the? The male didn't get a chance to finish that question. Cass turned on him and screamed as her entire body tensed up, magic sweeping through her in a black blaze. She splayed her fingers into talons and launched them forwards, kept on screaming out her fury as twin twisting orbs of darkness shot from her palms, struck the two males. Crimson rained down on her as they exploded, drenching the peeling white walls of the cavernous room with blood. Cass kept on screaming, couldn't stop herself as pain burned a path through her, felt as if it was destroying all of her. She leaned forwards, tears streaming down her face, agony ripping her to pieces inside as she broke down. The floor bucked beneath her, the entire building trembling. Holy hell, Valen muttered, sounding out of breath. So much for questioning them. Ah, oh, shit. Ares' grave voice pulled a hard sob from her as she stumbled to the block of ice and sank to her knees before Diamond. Everyone fell silent. Ares crouched beside her, but she couldn't bring herself to look at him. He growled as he scrubbed at something on the floor and she looked down at it at the circle drawn on the wooden boards. Pain and sorrow twisted inside her as she pieced together what had happened. The enemy had trapped Diamond here. Unable to attack them because of the ward, he had turned his power on himself. He had sacrificed himself to save the gates, to protect his world and this one. She cursed him for that, pressed her hands to the slick ice and stared at him. Her beautiful god. She closed her eyes, tensed. Her breath rushed from her. She lunged for Ares' hands, muttering a protection spell at the same time. He tried to break free as she grabbed him, but she refused to let go, fielding a black look from him. She gone crazy? Valen frowned at her as he leaned towards Merrick. Maybe, she muttered and brought Ares' hands to the ice, desperate to know that she wasn't imagining things. Melt it! Magic never lied, though. She closed her eyes saw the faint pulsing white outline of diamond in the center of the ice. Each pulse of light was paler than the last, and the time between them was growing. Hurry! She shoved Ares' hands harder against the ice. Back off, then. Ares jerked free of her grip and glared at her. I'm not doing this with you in the firing line. She shuffled away from him and everyone else backed off. Ares closed his eyes and blew out his breath his dark eyebrows drawing down as he moved his hands over the ice. Heat shimmered over them, starting to rise off his shoulders, too, as he worked to melt the ice. You're doing good, she said, hoping to encourage him, partly because she wanted him to keep going and partly because she didn't want him to burn the building down. She had never seen him try to control his fire before, hadn't realized how difficult it was for him. Sweat dotted his brow fizzled and turned to steam, and his face set in hard lines, concentration etched on it, his shoulders tensed, arms shaking. She looked at Diamond, more aware than ever of the similarities between him and Ares. Her heart went out to both of them, always having to hold back their powers and fight to keep them in check, so they didn't hurt the ones they loved. She was going to do something about that once this was all over. If Diamond came back to her, she would move heaven and earth to find a spell that would allow him to have physical contact with his brothers again. 
She would do the same for Ares as a thank you for helping her save the man she loved. The ice creaked and then cracked, great fault lines spreading across it as it gave under the heat of Ares' power. Water pooled around them, slipping between the cracks between the floorboards, dripping into the empty building below them. The faint pulses of light grew stronger as the ice melted away from Diamond. She swore she wasn't imagining it. Cass jerked right towards Ares as a huge chunk of ice crashed down and tumbled across the floor. More followed it and Merrick pulled her backwards as one came right at her. She gasped and looked at Ares, relief washing over her as none of them struck him. They melted as soon as they neared him, falling as water that hissed as it touched his skin. The moment the ice was gone from Diamond's upper half, she pulled free of Merrick's grip and rushed to him. She pressed her fingers to his throat, shivering as the cold numbed them, desperately seeking a sign of life. She whipped her head around when she found it. It's weak, she said, voice wobbling as emotions collided inside her, fear fighting the hope that had dared to rise. Merrick and Valen grabbed Diamond and hauled him from the ice, laying him out on the floorboards. They shook their hands, flexing their reddened fingers. It seemed even when he was close to death, Diamond's power still affected his body. Ares moved to him and held his hands palm down over his brother, ghosting them over him as Cass joined him. She kept her fingers to Diamond's throat, studying his pulse. It was too faint for her liking, slowing again. He was going to die. She shoved that thought out of her mind, banished it as determination flooded her, had her running through every spell she knew. She had studied the basics of necromancy and she was talented at healing. If she combined the two, would it be enough to pull a living person back from the brink of death? She looked down at Diamond, heart breaking and tears filling her eyes. It was worth a shot. Hey, Valen barked as she held her hand out and one of the knives he wore strapped to his ribs shot into her palm. His golden eyes widened and he lunged for her as she brought it down towards Diamond's throat. Karis grabbed her before he could, hauling her away from their brother, and she loosed a frustrated grunt when she tried to break free of his grip and couldn't. I can save him, she thought she could anyway. Let me go. Karis didn't look convinced. Let her try. Ares sagged beside her, shaking his head, his dark eyes bleak. I've done all I can. Karis kept hold of her, and just as she was about to lash out at him with the knife, he released her. She twisted back towards Diamond and carefully nicked his bare shoulder, just enough to draw a few drops of blood. She cut the tips of her index and middle finger and pressed them to the blood on Diamond's shoulder. Her eyes slipped shut as she focused on the powerful connection that formed between them. Cass started with the healing spell first, weaving the strongest one she could manage, and began threading it with incantations she had read in an ancient tome, one that had felt closest to the truth about necromancy to her. With the tracking spell still active, she could see Diamond as he lay before her, could see Karis as he came to kneel on the other side of him and pressed his fingers to Diamond's throat. Is it working? Ares said. Karis nodded. His pulse is getting stronger. Cass was careful to keep the focus of the spell heavily on the healing side, holding back the darker magic that rose within her, flooding her with cold. We need to be ready to move him the moment he's strong enough. Karis's tone had her focus slipping and the hairs on the back of her neck rising. This was all too easy. He was right about that. Maybe they figured he was dead and useless to them. Valen sounded hopeful. Maybe it's a trap. Merrick offered as a counterpoint. She was inclined to go with Merrick's theory. Focusing harder, she funneled the healing spell into Diamond, thawing the ice in his veins with it as the darker magic pooled around his heart and his brain. Think he might come back wrong? Valen whispered. Not helping, Ares muttered before she could say it. Just asking is all. I want him back as much as everyone else. But what if he comes back with a craving for brains? Cass frowned but didn't take her focus away from slowly healing Diamond's vital organs as she bit out. He wasn't dead. But he had been close. His lungs had taken a beating, were slow to respond as she poured the healing spell into them. The darker magic crawled down from his heart, spreading over his lungs, and she did her best to guide it, but it didn't feel entirely under her control. It was like it had a mind of its own. She could direct the healing spell, but the one intended to revive the dead was doing its own thing. Cass focused on building a tether between her and the spell, something it didn't like. She was beginning to understand why the great covens of the world had banned necromancy. 
The spell strained against her, attempting to pull away from her. Not good. She narrowed all her focus down to it, releasing her control over the healing spell and commanded it to return to her. When it didn't, she worked backwards over the incantation she had used to form it, pulling it apart piece by piece, something it really didn't like. Diamond jacked up off the floor and roared. Brains? Valen murmured, a worried note in his voice. Cass shoved her hands against Diamond's chest to hold him down and pumped another spell into him, one she hoped would contain his ice for at least a few minutes, because she couldn't do this alone. I'm starting to see why witches avoid necromancy. A little help. Merrick and Valen moved to pin Diamond down for her. His eyes shot open, Iris's pure white ringed with glowing blue. Cass grabbed the sides of his head and leaned over him, stared into those eyes and commanded the spell to release him. When it didn't, she pressed her mouth to his and breathed in, felt it as the treacherous spell that had been seeping into his lungs was drawn towards her. She broke away from his mouth and exhaled before covering it again and drawing another breath, stealing the air from his lungs. She tasted blood, and then ashes. She kept sucking in air as she pulled her head back. What the? Valen barked, disgust lacing his voice. Cass snapped Diamond's mouth closed the moment the twisting black and violet cloud passed his lips, and Karis pinched Diamond's nose as the spell lunged for it. She closed her hands around the spell and gritted her teeth as it fought her, as she muttered a reversal spell intended to erase it. Cass? The sound of her name had never been so sweet. She looked down into Diamond's ice-blue eyes, tears filling hers as he stared at her. What are you doing here? Diamond croaked. Valen began quietly singing Love is in the Air, earning himself a cuff around the back of his head from Merrick. Saving your sorry ass, Ares offered. I leave you alone for five minutes and you're off doing heroic shit. Diamond's eyes edged towards his brothers, and he pushed out a single word as a shudder racked him. Nemesis. We figured as much, Ares said. Cass wrestled with the unruly spell, closing her fingers tightly around it and trying to contain it as it attempted to leak out of even the smallest crack. Diamond looked back at her, his weary blue eyes lowering to her hands. What's? Oh, just a little necromancy. She tried to keep her voice light as she fought it. It's not happy to leave you. His eyes widened slightly. That was in me? I refer you back to the part where you were almost dead. She grunted as she hit the spell with another reversal incantation, and relaxed a little as this one was effective, had the ball of dark magic losing enough strength that she could contain it. It grew docile in her hands, and she was quick to finish unpicking the spell she had used to create it. Diamond tried to push up onto his elbows. Karis helped him, gripping his shoulders and easing him into a sitting position, and then quickly releasing him. Don't rush it. Cass warned, deeply aware that the healing spell was still at work inside him. You, uh, this isn't the only spell that I used, but it is the only one that I removed. Diamond pressed a hand to his stomach and paled. I thought I felt weird. That's probably the brush with death you had, Ares growled. Last time I'm letting you out of my sight. You should rest. Cass vanquished the spell and sagged as she let her hands fall to her lap. She needed a nice rest, too. Diamond nodded and looked around the apartment, and then at her. Did you deal with the Arinis? The Arinis, Kara said. They were here. Diamond frowned at all the blood. You didn't kill them. Little Miss Witch here popped two messengers like they were zits, but no one else was in the building. Valen flipped one of his knives in his hand, his eyes on Diamond the entire time. That bad feeling Cass had been having since Karis had announced reaching Diamond had been too easy returned full force. We should go. She placed her hand on Diamond's arm and looked at Karis. But you are exactly where we want you to be. The female voice rolled across the room. And it appears you do have exactly what we need. A second female voice echoed around her. Cold shot down Cass's spine. Merrick had been right. It was a trap. Diamond grabbed Cass, hauling her to him as he growled and bared emerging fangs, his eyes glittering like ice. Around them, violet-black smoke billowed and twisted, spreading to form five portals that flickered with green and purple lightning. The two Arinis stepped from the shadows, melting out of them, 
The bitches had been hiding in this room all along, waiting for the right moment to strike, waiting for her to reveal she could use necromancy and for Diamond to be free of his ice and revived, his blood ready for them to use against the gate. Kara seized hold of Ares as the male collared Valen and Valen grabbed Merrick. The moment everyone was in contact, darkness devoured them. Cass grunted when she was dumped unceremoniously on the damp grass of Central Park, and Diamond landed on her, his back slamming into her legs. She rolled as Karis dropped out of the air, too, narrowly avoiding being crushed by him. He crashed into the grass, breathing hard, sweat dotting his brow. Ares bit out a curse and rushed to check on him. Teleporting so many was dangerous. I had Valen and Merrick. Karis shook violently as he pushed onto his knees, his breath sawing from between his lips. His right hand had burns on it and his left was marred with black bruises, his fingers reddened by cold, telling her that the spell she had used on Diamond had faded but had done its job while it had lasted. That gave her something to go on, built hope that she could do something to help Ares and Diamond with their powers. Cass touched Karis's arm and funneled a healing spell into him as she looked up at Ares. We need to move. Can't. That single word leaving Diamond's lips had everyone looking at him and cold stealing through her. Dread pooled inside her. What do you mean, Kent? Remorse shone in his eyes as he glanced at her. They've been in contact with me. They can open the gate. I can't let them near it. You're in no fit state to fight, she barked and froze, her anger rushing from her as her eyes darted around the dimly lit field. Portals opened in all directions, demons spilling from them. Ares turned his back to her, facing a group of twenty demons as they charged towards them. Valen moved to stand on the other side of her, his fingers flexing around his blade as lightning arced along the metal. Karis lumbered onto his feet, shaking his head. I'm getting you out of here. Your brothers can handle this. Cass formed the incantation in her mind, heart racing as she hurried to complete it before Diamond could do something reckless, like launching into the fray as a fight erupted around them. Get her out of here. Diamond pulled her hand from his arm, and she had never heard him so afraid or so desperate. You'll need me here, she snapped, and tried to seize him again, determined to stay with him if he wasn't going to let her take him away from the fight. Before she could grab him, someone grabbed her. Darkness whirled around her. Fury poured through her. No damned way she was being benched. She hit Merrick with the first spell that rose to her fingertips, one that blasted him away from her and screamed as she fell into the abyss hit something very solid. Cass wheezed, struggling to get air into her lungs as her entire body ached, and pushed onto her hands and knees. Was she back in Tokyo? Or Central Park? She stood on wobbly legs. Her blood chilled as she took in her surroundings. Black land stretched in all directions, rising into sharp mountains ahead of her. Beyond an enormous obsidian Greek temple, Cass swallowed hard. The underworld, she froze as metal clanked and air shifted around her, and edged her hands up in front of her. The four males clad in black armor only jerked the pointed tips of their onyx spears closer to her head. This wasn't good. She reevaluated that thought as a crushing wave of dark power pressed down on her, driving her to her knees on the basalt. Cass fought the power, resisted it enough to lift her head, and wished she hadn't as her stomach dropped. Before her towered a man with malice in his crimson eyes, a god whose crown rose in jagged onyx spikes from his black hair. The warm light of his realm reflected off the black metal plates of his armor as he shifted slightly, a breeze catching the heavy blood-red cloak fixed to his shoulders. He lowered the bident he gripped and pointed it at her chest and then lifted it, so the cold metal kissed her skin and she had to tip her head back to avoid being cut. Cass stared up at him. Her breath lodged in her throat as his scarlet eyes burned with rage. Hades pressed forwards, his voice a black snarl. A life for a life. Chapter 35 Diamond's entire body ached, felt as if a gatekeeper had pummeled him, given him a five-minute breather, and then gone in for another round. Memories flickered across his mind as he fought a group of demons four adult males who were attempting to breach the barrier he and his brothers formed between the portals and the gate. He remembered the cold, the fear, the painful thought that he would never see Cass again. The last thing he could remember was thinking of her, and she had been the first thing he had seen upon being revived. 
gods, he had never beheld a sweeter sight than her sitting beside him, fighting to bring him back to her. He owed her a thousand apologies when they were back together, and they would be back together. Lightning crashed down just off to his left, spraying black blood and pieces of demon across the slick grass. To his right, flames blazed a path through another group of males, filling the air with the stench of burning flesh. Shadows rushed across the ground, blending with the night before they shot upwards to impale a male and dragged him down as he screamed and writhed, fighting their hold. Beyond the first wave of demons, a second wave spilled out of the portals. He cursed. Merrick appeared beside him. A wall of baked earth rose up, encircling the field, cutting off the demons he and his brothers were fighting from the next wave. Those demons growled and snarled on the other side of the ten-foot-high wall. It wouldn't hold them for long, but hopefully it would slow them down enough that Diamond and his brothers could deal with making sure the gate was safe. He turned towards Merrick to thank him. One glance was all it took to see that something had gone wrong. I lost Cassandra, Merrick said, guilt and pain shining in his dark eyes. She broke free of me during the teleport. Diamond's heart lurched and icy talons formed over his fingers. What do you mean she broke free of you? She hit me with a spell that sent me flying. There was nothing I could do. Diamond couldn't breathe. He bent forwards, clutching his knees as his mind whirled, thoughts spinning so quickly that he felt sick. He didn't know what might have happened to her, where she might be. Gods, he didn't need this. He was tired, in constant pain as his body tried to complete the healing that Cass's spell had set in motion. Remaining focused on keeping the demons from the gate had been taxing enough. Now that fragile focus was split between the battle and fear for Cass. What if she had landed somewhere in the underworld? If she had, she could take care of herself. She was strong, a powerful warrior, one who had proven she could handle anything life threw at her. He had to trust that she would make it through or at the very least survive long enough for him to finish with these demons and go after her. A portal formed on the inside of the wall. The Arinis stepped out of it, their violet eyes fixed beyond him on the point where the gate was hidden. Could this night get any shittier? It felt as if the Moirai had answered that question with a mocking laugh as he felt the gate opening behind him. Impossible. He twisted to face that direction as Merrick joined the fray, teaming up with Ares and Valen. He glanced at Karis where he fought a few feet away, taking on six demons by himself. None of his brothers were close enough to the gate to trigger it. It shouldn't be opening. He looked back at the Arinies. The two blondes stood in front of the portal, an entire legion of demons forming behind them, at least three dozen strong. Was it their doing? He looked his bare chest over, focused on his body, sure that they hadn't managed to cut him and take his blood. Had Nemesis given some to them? Had they taken it before he had tried to kill himself? Even if they had, he wasn't sure it would be enough for them to trigger the gate from such a vast distance. It wasn't responding to him, and he was standing closer to it, he backed off, leaving his brothers to deal with the demons as he turned all his focus on the gate. A blinding pinprick of violet light burst into existence in the middle of the field before him, spreading rapidly to form the central disk of the gate. It hovered flat above the grass, at least five feet wide, and pulsed brightly, birthing the first colorful ring. What the hell? Ares snarled from behind him. You doing that? No, Diamond snapped. It's not me opening it but he would be the one to close it. He focused on the gate, narrowing the world down to it, trusting his brothers could deal with the demons without him. The gate flashed again and another ring formed, growing outwards. Glyphs shimmered to life around the ring, swirling with color. Diamond commanded that ring to shrink. It grew larger. Fear threatened to seize him, but he pushed back against it and focused harder, demanding that the gate close itself. His head turned and he pressed a hand to it, squeezed his eyes shut as his vision blurred. He could do this. He sent another command to the gate. A third ring formed, rotating slowly counterclockwise. Fuck. Ares, Diamond hollered. Can you close it? Ares appeared beside him, his face etched in lines of concentration as he stared at the gate. Ten seconds trickled past, filled with the crack of lightning and the sound of grunts and screams as the battle raged behind them. Ares looked at him out of the corner of his eye, defeat shining in his gaze. I can't. It's not responding to me. It's like someone is overriding me. Diamond stared at the gate, that feeling echoing inside him too as he watched another ring form, 
helpless to stop it. He tried anyway, gritting his teeth and grunting as he exerted all of his will on the gate. Go, go, Meadow yelled, and Diamond sensed the wave of demons rushing forwards, heard the thunder of their footsteps as they charged across the grass at his brothers. Diamond fought harder, struggling to focus on the gate and his power over it as his head grew foggy, his body sluggish and slow to respond as he tried to lift his hands. Ares growled and heat licked at Diamond's back, a wall of fire that wouldn't keep the demons at bay for long. His brother would need to keep fueling that wall of fire, draining himself. Diamond had to get the gate to respond to him. He raked one of his icy talons over his arm, drawing blood. Are you crazy? Ares lunged for him and Diamond leaped away, placing some distance between them. I need more control over it. Diamond dragged another claw over his arm and corrected himself. I need some control. It will respond to my blood. He wasn't sure that it would. He had never seen a gate act like this. He had never felt as if it was ignoring him. Sometimes they resisted, but it was as if he wasn't even here. Just keep the Arrhenes away from it. Diamond glanced at Ares, and the grim look in his brother's eyes said that he was well aware of what might happen if the two Furies managed to get closer to the gate. They were already making it hard enough on him, their control over it something that felt impossible given the distance between them and it. But it had to be them opening it. Diamond strode towards the gate, intent on closing it and stopping them. His vision tunneled again and he shook his head, waited a moment for it to clear before he continued. Blood tracked down his arm and he grimaced as he raked a third line in his flesh, adding more, aware that he was going to need it. Lightning rocked the ground and he wobbled, his left knee buckling. He staggered in that direction and managed to remain upright. Diamond grunted as something smashed into him, knocking him onto his side. His head whipped towards it. A growl tore from his lips as the winged scaly demon lunged for him again, sharp black talons slashing towards him. He rolled across the dewy grass, the scent of his blood growing thicker in the air as he evaded the demon's blow. Diamond raised his right arm and ice shot up from the earth, tinged red with his own blood. Huge leathery wings beat the air towards him as the male lifted off, elevating himself away from the reach of Diamond's ice, fading into the night. Diamond scoured the darkness, remaining still on the grass, anticipating another attack. When it didn't come, he rolled onto his knees and pushed off, rushing towards the gate. Air whooshed. Diamond ducked, sweeping his upper body to his right as the demon cut across him. Fire streaked across his back and he cried out, the fog in his head growing thicker as blood leaked down his side. He stumbled onwards, eyes locked on the gate as another ring formed. The demon swooped again. A bright explosion of light struck the male and he flew through the air, fire licking over his wings as he tumbled and twisted. Ares growled and launched another fireball at the demon. You all right? Diamond managed to nod. Another two winged demons plunged from the darkness, both of them aiming for Ares. His brother launched another two orbs of fire, hitting one but missing the other. Diamond stretched his arm out to the gate as the demon barreled into Ares, lifting him off the ground and into the night. Damn it. He peered into the darkness, scouring it for his brother, his heart shooting into his throat. A huge burst of flame flashed about eighty feet above him and then it was gone. He pivoted on his heel as he heard Ares grunt somewhere behind him, spotted him close to Merrick as he tackled three demons, battling them with spears of solid earth. Shadows sliced through the demons, severing limbs, and swirled around Ares, forming a protective wall as he struggled onto his feet. Lightning blinded Diamond as it forked from the sky, splitting into a dozen jagged white-purple points. Demon shrieked as the bolts connected, the sound carrying in the still night air. Mortal authorities would be coming. By now, someone would have reported the sounds of the fight coming from the park. He had to move quickly. Karis could freeze time for any human in the vicinity, but he couldn't do it when he was fighting, too. His older brother would have to focus, and that wasn't going to happen when dozens of demons were coming at them in waves, forcing him to use his shadows to protect himself, the gate, and his brothers. Diamond wasn't sure Karis could freeze time even if he could concentrate. Valen had told him about what had happened in the villa outside of Rome, how Karis hadn't been able to completely stop time for the demons there. Apparently, even Karis had his limits. Diamond glanced at the demons surrounding them, doubting his brother would be able to stop them. Shadows ripped through the ones nearest Karis. His brother might not be able to stop them in their tracks, but he could stop them in another way. 
Agonized bellows filled the night as Karis went to town on the demons. Satisfied that the enemy were occupied and he had time, Diamond turned back towards the gate. Grunted as pain spread across his stomach, he looked down at the delicate feminine hand close to his hip, gripping a blade that sank deeper into his flesh as she pushed forwards. Diamond swayed towards her, blinking to clear his vision as he struggled to lift his eyes to the woman before him. She said not to kill you, Melody hissed as she leaned closer, bringing her mouth to his ear. She didn't say anything about not maiming you a little. She yanked the violet blade free of his flesh, jerking him forwards with it, and he staggered and fell into her, was quick to grab her. She screeched as his ice swept over her bare shoulders, shoved him in the chest and broke contact with him. Her purple eyes brightened dangerously as she inspected her reddened shoulders and narrowed as black bruises formed beneath the ice that melted on her skin. Bastard! She backhanded him. Everything went dark for a second and then the world was sideways. It took him a moment to realize he was on the ground. Melody grabbed him by his ankle and dragged him, towards the gate. He tried to teleport, but nothing happened. Tried to summon his ice, but his head turned and he almost blacked out. Heat spread through him, a strange sensation that stemmed from the wound on his stomach. He blinked to clear his wobbly vision and looked at the blade she clutched. The Wraith's blade. Toxin. She had hit him with the poison that coated it. If he wasn't healed soon, he would die from it. He angled his head to his right and stared at the gate as they approached it, although he had a sinking feeling that death would come for him before the toxin could kill him. The fury lifted her arm and he flew over her head, slammed into the earth in front of her and grunted as blood burst from his lips, his vision dimming again before it came back. Diamond! Valen's frantic bellow echoed in his ears and he sought his brother. His eyebrows furrowed as he spotted him, Merrick, Ares, and Karis fighting Meadow and the horde of demons spilling from the portal that had opened between him and them. Diamond weakly kicked at Melody, trying to break free of her. She clucked her tongue and leaned over him, backhanded him so hard he blacked out again. He was vaguely aware of the battle that blazed only fifty feet from him, of his brothers as they fought to reach him and called out his name, and of Melody as she gripped his hair and hauled him onto his knees before the gate. The colorful light of it shimmered across his eyes as they struggled to focus. Fear and hopelessness washed through him, a cruel combination that left him cold as he stared at the blurry gate. Were the Furies opening it for Nemesis so she could pass into this world and destroy it and his own one? Melody yanked his head back and poised the blade at his throat, ready to cut him the second the gate had fully formed and spill enough blood that it would remain open, causing catastrophic damage to both realms bringing about the calamity the Mwari had foreseen. He couldn't let that happen. He couldn't fail. He summoned the last of his strength, focusing on his power as the final ring of the gate expanded, desperately clawing it together for one more attempt to break free of Melody's hold. Diamond tried to lift his hand to grab Melody's, intending to freeze her and force her to release him. His hand refused to move. He edged his eyes downwards, stared at his hands where they rested on his lap, drenched in his own blood as it pumped from the wound in his side. The central purple disc of the gate flashed. Melody pressed the blade into his throat. It was over. Chapter 36 Cassandra's first instinct was to use her magic to blast Hades and his guards away from her. Probably not a great idea. Her second instinct was to use that same magic to cast a spell that would transport her to Tokyo. Only when she tried it, nothing happened. She stared wide-eyed up at the dark god towering over her, despair swift to flood her as she realized there was no escaping him. It was right there in his cold smile, in those murderous red eyes. The bastard knew her magic was useless, which meant he had done something to disable it, or there was something about his realm that stopped it from working. Hades pressed his bident closer to her throat. She leaned back, tilting her head up further as she swallowed hard, and stared into his eyes as she cast a few prayers to various gods out into the ether, just in case one of them was listening. His lips compressed and twisted into a vicious sneer, his black eyebrows knitting hard above eyes that glowed the color of blood. She had thought Karis dark. Karis looked like a puppy compared to this man. A life for a life he growled again. Her life, but for whose? 
You murdered my son, he gritted, snarling each word, every pause of punctuation that drove them home. Made her realize whose life he was talking about. Diamonds. He's alive. She went to jerk forwards as those desperate words burst from her lips and froze in time to stop herself from slitting her own throat on the sharp tips of his weapon. He died. Hades pressed forwards and so did his guards. More than one of their spears nicked her, but she refused to flinch as she faced Hades, refused to show any weakness he could use against her. He's alive, she bit out, her eyebrows furrowing as she looked up at him. I swear it. You speak lies, witch. He loomed over her, the very air around him seeming to darken as his eyes brightened further, blazing with the fires of the underworld, with pain. He truly thought his son was dead. She wanted to shake her head but couldn't without cutting herself. He's not dead. I brought him back. You killed him. He lowered the bident and she glanced down, her eyes widening again as she mentally cursed. Diamond's blood was on her hands. No. She shook her head now that his weapon was away from her throat, leaned forwards and clasped her hands in front of her, opened them again and held them out to him. I was bringing him back. Blood magic. I would never hurt Diamond. It killed me when I thought I had lost him. His jaw flexed. He didn't look as if he believed her. A delicate pale hand slid over his left shoulder and he stiffened, his scarlet gaze edging towards it. Fingers brushed over the ornate clasps that fixed his red cloak to his shoulders and then drifted lower, skating down his arm. The witch speaks true, my love. The softest female voice Cass had ever heard danced in the air, full of light and warmth, and seriously out of place in the dark realm. A slender female clad in layers of black that formed a flowing dress over her curves stepped around the god the smile that curled her lips far from fitting given the dire situation. Her green eyes softened as she lifted her right hand and cupped Hades' cheek. Around her bare feet, poppies bloomed, the same color as her scarlet hair. Hades began to lean into her touch and then pulled away, drawing a frown from the goddess. No, he boomed. She murdered our son. I didn't, Cass snapped and lunged forwards, desperate for him to believe her. She did not, Persephone said and touched his cheek again, her caress like black magic, more powerful than anything Cass had at her disposal. The god softened again, looked unsure for the first time, but it was there and gone in the blink of an eye. I felt him die, Hades growled and lifted the bident to Cass's throat again, forcing her to lean back. He's alive. He's fighting right now to protect the gate. If you just listen for five seconds and let me explain. She held her hands up when his eyes darkened, his handsome face twisting in a thunderous look. Perhaps demanding a god king listen to her and ordering him around had been a bad idea. Let the witch speak, my love. Persephone worked her magic again, stroking his cheek, softening the hard edges of his expression. When Hades didn't try to kill Cass and didn't speak, she took it as a chance to tell her side of the story. Escher was called for penitence and Diamond went. He didn't come back, though. I was worried about him. She rushed each word out, unsure how long she was going to be given before Hades decided to go ahead and kill her. Now was not the time for lengthy and detailed explanations. Now was the time for speed. The brothers, your sons, we feared the enemy had him. The Irinis know which gate is bound to who, so we went to New York, and I used the spell to track Diamond. When I found him, he had encased himself in ice. He was almost dead when Ares got him free, and I used... She hesitated. Was it wise to tell a god-king that you used necromancy to save his dying son? Hades gave her a look that demanded she continue, his bident backing him up as he pressed it forwards, prodding her throat with the sharp tips. I used a healing spell and the basic theory of necromancy to... Necromancy? He barked, and she leaned back as he pressed forwards. Persephone gently placed a hand on his arm and lowered the bident from Cass's throat. It would explain the sensation of death you felt. Hades cast her a withering look, one that made it abundantly clear he wanted to argue with her. Yet he didn't. He huffed and eased back, scowling at Cass. Continue. Well, he's alive now, and he confirmed what we had suspected. 
nemesis is involved in this. Cass froze up when Hades' eyes blazed so brightly she was surprised she didn't get burned. Nemesis, he growled, and Cass really hoped that murderous look in his eyes was for the traitorous goddess now. Why would she? Persephone looked worried as she gazed at her husband. Many reasons, Hades snarled, his deep voice rolling across the land like thunder. Power, revenge. She believes I forced her into a life of servitude here after the last rebellion, when the roles of the gods and goddesses in these lands altered. I had her replace the Erinnyes as punishment for her disobedience. Disobedience? Cass couldn't hold back that question. Hades narrowed his crimson eyes on her. I sent a summons to Nemesis, but she refused to answer. Rumors spread that she had sided with my enemy, but when we found her, she was bound and caged, and said that she had been captured by the enemy when she had tried to come to aid me. Hades growled, the sound of vicious black snarl as his lips peeled back off his fangs. You believed her? Cass said what he wouldn't, because she needed to know what had happened. He nodded. The rebellion had been crushed, and the realm was safe, but I wanted someone to punish any who would attempt to break one of my rules. I moved her into a position I thought would suit her, allowing her to disperse justice. My justice. At first, she seemed to enjoy it, but then I noticed things. Small things. I began to feel she wasn't satisfied, and when I approached her, she spoke of how her small realm felt like another cage. Wanting my people to be happy, I gave her more freedom, allowing her to come and go from that realm as she pleased. Well, Cass could see why Nemesis hadn't exactly been happy about her new station. Putting someone who had been held captive in a cage into a realm she couldn't leave was just moving her into a new cage. Do you think now that the rumors had been true? She had been working with your enemy, and when you had been close to discovering it, she had faked it all? She caught the flicker of confusion in his eyes, there and gone, hidden before anyone could really notice it. This god didn't like to look uneducated. He had pride, possibly too much of it. That was never a good thing, but she wasn't about to call him on the fact she needed to explain what she meant by faked it. Maybe she had her people harm her and lock her away to make it look like she was still on your side. Hades roared, the sound deafening and the ground bucked and shook so hard that one of the guards to her right landed on his backside, and Persephone clung to her husband, casting fearful green eyes around her as fault lines spread across the black earth. And Cass had thought his sons had serious tempers. Hades did not like to be crossed. I will murder her with my own hands. He raised his right black gauntlet and curled his talons into a fist. He turned a glare on his guards. Dispatch three legions immediately. She cannot leave these lands with the gates closed. Find her. Hades pivoted on his heel, his red cloak swirling outwards with the sharp action, and Cass lunged onto her feet as her heart lurched. Wait! She held a hand out to him, desperation flooding her, making her limbs shake. He stopped and looked back at her. I need to get back to Diamond. Merrick tried to take me from the fight, but Diamond needs me there. I need to be there. Her eyebrows furrowed as she thought about him fighting when he was weak, her mind filling with the reckless things he might do to fulfill his duty. Like bleeding himself dry to seal a gate, he wouldn't survive it. You worry about him, Persephone said, her voice the first soft kiss of morning light. I don't think worry is a strong enough word. Cass shook her head and smiled solemnly. Diamond is in bad shape, but I know he won't leave. He'll stay and fight and do his duty, and it will get him killed. Valen, Keras, Ares, and Merrick are there, but I'm afraid. I don't want to lose him. I need to be there. Hades turned to face her, a calculating edge to his crimson eyes. She speaks true. The gate is in danger. I will send you to my son. Persephone looked pleased to hear that, smiled up at her husband with relief and love glittering in her green eyes. When she turned that same look on Cass, Cass had the feeling it was partly because she had just said without so many words that she was in love with Diamond. She waited for the restriction on her magic to lift. When it didn't, she looked at Hades. How was he intending to send her back to Diamond? He lifted a gauntleted hand above his head. Between them, a violet pinprick of light sparked to life, 
and she couldn't believe her eyes as it rapidly expanded into a disc that faced her. It pulsed, and a ring appeared around it, growing in size as glyphs shimmered and chased along the curve of it. It rotated swiftly, and another ring appeared inside it, this one spinning counterclockwise, glowing with rainbow colors. A gate. This was dangerous. She felt that in her bones. The enemy wanted a gate open, and Hades was doing it for them. She looked at him through the shimmering form of the gate. There was a gleam in his eyes as he watched it, fire that shone so brightly that she couldn't miss it. He wanted this opportunity to draw the enemy to him. He wanted to fight, too. Beside him, Persephone cast him a worried look. Cass was inclined to agree with the goddess. Hades' hunger for battle was not a good thing. It was better that the enemy was kept away from this world and from him, and that he let his sons do their duties and complete the mission he had given to them. A scream rolled up her throat and she stumbled backwards as the ground shook beneath her and a huge bipedal beast appeared out of the gloom, thundering towards the gate. Mottled stony gray skin stretched tight over the powerful muscles of the five-story tall monstrosity. It shook its head and roared the gray-blue horns that covered the top of its head seeming to grow before her eyes as its silver irises glowed brighter. Go now, Hades barked, and turned towards the beast, grinning at it. Cass realized that the hunger for violence that shone in his eyes hadn't been about drawing the enemy to him. It had been about preparing to face this beast, a gatekeeper. Cass's pulse pounded as she ran for the gate, determined to make it there before the monster could reach Hades. Diamond needed her. She leaped into the sparkling violet disc of the gate, screamed as colors twisted around her, and she felt as if someone had thrown her into a psychedelic blender. Up and down blurred as she spun, bile rose up her throat. Her feet suddenly hit solid ground and she jerked forwards as they stuck to it like glue, flailed her arms to stop herself from falling flat on her face, and breathed a sigh of relief when she straightened. That relief was short-lived as she was lifted upwards. It turned to horror as the colorful light receded, revealing Diamond where he knelt at the edge of the horizontal rings of the gate, about to have his throat slit. Cass launched her hands forwards, relief blasting through her when twin orbs of magic shot from her palms. Get your damned hands off my man, she snarled as the spell struck the fury who had been holding him and sent her flying through the air. Diamond's ice-blue eyes widened, shock dancing in them as he stared at her. His white eyebrows lifted slightly. She knew what he was thinking. He was her man, and she was damned if she was going to let someone take him from her. His eyes sparkled with warmth as she finished rising out of the gate, as she walked on unsteady legs towards him, trying to ignore the fact she was levitating a good two feet above the rings of the gate. How the hell? He took her hand when she was close enough, helped her down, but swept her up into his arms before she could touch the ground. What happened? I could ask you the same thing. She hugged him and then made him release her, because she hadn't missed the fact he was bleeding everywhere and that he looked tired, on the verge of collapse. When he loosened his hold on her, she placed her hand over his stomach and funneled a healing spell into him, stopping the bleeding and destroying the toxin that tainted his blood. She looked into his eyes, caught the fatigue that still laced them, and decided she could spare a little more of her strength to give him a boost. She quickly pieced together another spell, one that would share some of her energy with him, and funneled that into him too. His eyes instantly brightened, the dark circles beneath them fading, and she felt his strength returning. You opened the gate? He looked at it, confusion shimmering in his eyes and then at her. She shook her head. Not me, your father. His face fell, the color draining from it as he pushed her back and looked her over. Did he hurt you? No. She kept the fact he had tried to hurt her to herself. I landed in the underworld and we had a talk, and then he opened this gate and here I am. I told him about you and about Nemesis. Diamond caught her jaw and tilted it upwards as he glared at her throat, as he brushed thumbs over two sore spots on it. Just talked, eh? He frowned at her. There might have been a little growling, some poking, and a few misunderstandings. But I'm safe, unharmed. And this really isn't the place for long conversations. She hurled a spell to her right without looking, and the three demons who had been charging towards them screamed as it struck them, tore them to pieces. We need to close this gate, Diamond said, a note of worry in his voice that relayed his feelings to her. She was here with him, 
Together they could do this. She pressed a brief kiss to Diamond's lips and then turned her back to him. He pressed his against it as he unleashed a devastating wave of ice spears at a group of demons. Cass hurled freezing spells at several demons who were fighting his brothers, picking them off and even in the odds a little for them. Merrick looked at her, relief shining in his dark eyes. She probably owed him an apology. Cass frowned as she glanced beyond them and spotted more portals opening. How many demons did the enemy have on their side? She couldn't even guess at the number of dead that lay on the battlefield around them. Judging by the state of Diamond's brothers, it had already been too many. Valen, Merrick, and Ares, and even Karis had multiple injuries, were bleeding from several wounds as they fought the demons and tried to fight the two Arinis. The twin blondes were too fast, easily dodging fireballs and lightning, spears of earth and shadows as they attempted to get closer to the gate again. Diamond's brothers had their hands full. She looked at the demons who were piling over the remains of an earthen wall. Maybe it was time she leveled the playing field a little. Cass focused on the spell, building the same one she had used in Tokyo, even though she knew it would drain her. Diamond fought at her back, dealing with any demons who got too close to the gate. Her magic twined around him, drawn to his power, and she held it back, unwilling to draw on him. She could feel he was weak, struggling as it was to fight the enemies and work on the gate. She muttered the incantation. She clenched her fists as magic surged through her, leaving her trembling in its wake, and exploded from her in a shock wave. It rolled across the land, disintegrating the dead and sending the weaker living demons flying, leaving only the strongest ones behind. When it neared the wall, it shot upwards, forming a dome over the area. The demons outside it immediately began battering it, every strike of their fists feeling like a blow dealt to her. They echoed on her body, faint for now, but if the fight carried on for too long, there would be a cumulative effect and she would really start feeling them. Diamond's brothers didn't miss a beat, kept on fighting as the number of demons they were facing dwindled, giving them more chances to attack the Arinis. Several demons attempted to make a run for it upon seeing the odds were now stacked against them instead. They hit the edge of the barrier and bounced off it, landing on their backsides. She smiled wickedly. Her barriers worked both ways. Nothing got in, nothing got out. Lightning bounced off the dome, tearing a grunt from her lips and a ripe curse from Valen. When the bright white-purple flash came again, it surged up from below, striking several demons through their legs. Ares and Merrick switched tactics too, drawing the demons away from the barrier so their attacks wouldn't strike it. Karis tore through a group with his shadows and smiled coldly when a feminine shriek pierced the din of battle. Maybe he did resemble his father, had that same darkness within him, as deep and black as an abyss. The fury he had found shot up into the air, a shadow snaring her leg, and screamed as it twisted with her, bringing her back down in a swift and brutal arc. She smashed into two male demons, knocking them flying, and rolled across the grass. Cass launched a spell at her as she struggled onto her feet, and then another and another as the female spotted her and rolled left and right, evading her attacks. The fury pushed onto her knees and then her feet, and sprinted towards her on a low, vicious hiss. The light of the closing gate washed over her face as she thundered towards Cass. Cass broke away from the gate, hoping to give Diamond time to close it. She ran at the fury, grunted as they collided and slammed her palm into the female's stomach. The blonde hissed as she flew backwards, violet light sizzling over her skin and hit the ground hard. The second fury whipped to face her, bared fangs and growled as she spotted her sister on the ground. She lashed out at Merrick with her claws, driving him back, and made a break for it, charging towards Cass. Shadow seized her legs and she hit the ground face first. The first fury was on her feet and running at Cass again. Cass launched minor spells at her, ones designed to knock her away and do some damage. They were low level and wouldn't drain her. She needed to reserve most of her energy for maintaining the barrier. The goddess dodged most of the spells that zoomed at her and grunted when one struck her shoulder, spinning her backwards. She found her footing and came at Cass again, faster this time. Cass bit out a curse in Russian. She summoned a barrier spell and shoved both of her hands forwards, sending a glowing blue wall at the female. The fury broke straight through it as if it was paper and barreled into Cass. Cass! Diamond yelled, and she wrestled with the goddess, using her magic to give her a boost in strength. I have this! she shouted, 
not quite sure that she did have it when the fury caught her with her talons, raking them across her side and cutting through her corset. Take care of the gate, because it was almost closed. The fury threw a desperate look at it, and then off to her right. The second goddess was on her feet again, running for Diamond. Shadows chased her, and lightning shot up from the ground all around her. She nimbly dodged and rolled, leaped and managed to evade all of the attacks as she closed in on Diamond. Cast threw a spell at her, regretted it when the one she had been using to boost her strength faltered, the drain on her magic proving too much. The barrier around them shimmered and she focused on it, shoring it back up again, aware that she couldn't let it fall no matter what happened to her. It was all that stood between the brothers and close to one hundred demons. The second fury reached Diamond, lashing at him with her claws, driving him back as he tried to reach Cass. Cass looked at him as the fury she had been fighting got her in a chokehold and dragged her backwards. Power vibrated in the air. A portal. She craned her neck to look behind her as she grabbed the fury's arms, cursed when violet black clouds billowed outwards from a point only a few feet away. She clawed at the goddess's arm, drawing blood, and pressed her hands to the crimson liquid, forming a connection between them. The goddess shrieked in her ear as the spell seeped into her, and Cass wove it with another, turning it toxic, hoping to weaken the fury enough that she could break free. She kicked and scrambled with her legs as the bitch pulled her backwards, as the power of the portal grew heavier in the air. Cass looked at Diamond, awareness washing through her, leaving her cold. She couldn't stop the fury in time. He paused as he grappled with the second fury and stared at her, hurt welling in his striking eyes laced with despair and hopelessness that crashed over her too. A vicious roar cut through the night as the barrier flickered and faded. Diamond's head jerked up and he ducked as the fury he had been fighting released him and threw herself to the ground. Cass stared wide-eyed as a huge lion-like creature with feathered eagle wings and gleaming talons shot past him, heading straight for her. This wasn't good. Those talons flexed, aimed right at her. It was going to rip her to pieces. Chapter 37 Diamond ducked and then popped to his feet as the winged lion shot past him, heading for Cass. She froze in the fury's grip, horror shining in her blue eyes as she stared at the beast that was zooming towards her. Diamond had never been so glad to see the little bastard. Mr. Milo swooped upwards, grabbing the fury with his talons and hauling her up into the night air on hard beats of his feathered wings. The guardian deity growled as he sank fangs into the female's shoulder, as he raked at her with his claws. The goddess fought him as they twisted in the air, scratching at him with her own talons, hissing and snarling the whole time. Cass sagged to her knees, eyes fixed in a blank stare ahead of her and her skin far too pale for Diamond's liking. He kicked off, determined to grab her before Meadow could recover from the blow he had delivered when Mr. Milos had distracted her with his overly dramatic and extremely late entrance. He left the second fury in the dust as blood rained down from the sky. The battle that raged there slowly drew Cass's stunned gaze upwards. Heat licked across his back and he didn't need to look to know Meadow was on her feet and coming after him. Ares grunted as he hurled another fireball at her and she screamed as this one connected blasting her towards the gate. Diamond's breath hitched and he skidded on the grass, twisting towards the gate. Meadow shot straight through the lingering ring and central violet disc, tumbled across the ground and rolled to a halt. The ring shrank into the central disc and it began to grow smaller, burning brighter as the power of the gate was condensed down into a single tiny orb. That orb flashed, the violet light blinding him as it filled the darkness, and then it was gone. Meadow scrambled onto her feet and glared at where the gate was hidden. A pinprick of purple light burst back into existence. Shit, Ares muttered and raced past him, Valen hot on his heels. I'll handle this. Diamond nodded and pivoted, hurried to Cass and helped her onto her feet. She continued to stare up at the sky, watching Mr. Milos as he fought the fury. More than just her blood was splattering them now. The Guardian was taking heavy damage, too. He willed Milos to fight harder, and to survive. As much as he couldn't stand the cat, he had to make it through the battle. Cass would be devastated if something happened to him. Someone whimpered, and then Melody plummeted out of the sky, landing hard on her back on the grass, blood bursting from her lips as her body jerked upwards. Diamond figured the goddess was done for. 
She was still for a tense minute, and then she coughed and rolled over, pressed her hands and knees into the dirt, and shook her head. Damn. Twin orbs of twisting green and purple light shot past Diamond and slammed into the goddess, sending her flying. Bitch, Cass muttered and sagged in his arms. He clutched her to him with one arm and raised his other one, and I shot up from the ground as Melody ran at him. The Fury managed to dodge the first shard, but the second caught her calf, and the third pierced her thigh, sending her toppling forwards, just as the fourth jagged spear of ice shot up from the ground, one he had intended to use to block her path to Cass. The thicker shard impaled her chest, crimson swift to roll down it as it sliced clean through her and the pointed tip emerged from her back. Melody! Meadow yelled, pain and fury in that one word, together with fear. The Fury cast one look at her fallen sister and then spun on her heel, sprinting for a portal that formed just a few feet ahead of her. Ares growled and hurled a fireball at her, and lightning shot up from the ground just in front of her. She threw herself to her left, rolled and came onto her feet, kicked off and leaped, straight through the portal. Karis snarled, a black growl that had Diamond focusing on his brother to see what had him so upset. The demons were fleeing. It was over at least for now. He gathered Cass to him, held her close, and pressed a kiss to her messy black hair, a thousand feelings crashing over him as his battle instincts waned. Fear was at the helm, had him clinging to Cass as his mind filled with all the ways things could have gone differently. Gone wrong. He had come close to losing her too many times tonight. When she pulled back and looked up into his eyes, pain shimmering in hers together with tears, he knew that feeling echoed inside her, too. Mr. Milos landed as his brother strode towards him, Karis helping Merrick as he pressed a hand to his thigh, and Valen and Ares arguing about who had let the other fury escape. Cass slowly turned towards the winged lion, tense at first. Fear ran through her and a glow lit her palm, chasing back the night. He smiled as he realized she didn't know who had been the one to save her. As the beast limped towards her, blood tracking down his left front leg, and the light of her spell washed over him to reveal scars on his face and the notch in his ear. Recognition dawned in her eyes. Milos, she breathed, her face crumpling as she broke free of Diamond's grip and hurried to him. The guardian deity shrank back to his other form as she rushed to meet him, his wings disappearing into his back and white splotches growing on his fur. By the time Cass had reached him, he was a cat again purring loudly as Cass swept him up into her arms and fussed over him, using a healing spell on his injuries. She looked at Diamond, frowned. You don't look surprised. She glanced at his brothers. None of you do. Ares and Valen shrugged. Merrick grimaced as he applied pressure to his thigh. Karis didn't react at all. He was too busy scouring the darkness, where shadows lashed at the bodies of the demons, devouring them, and leaving nothing more than withered husks behind that broke down in the gentle breeze that swept through the park. How long have you known? Her gaze drifted back to Diamond. From the moment I met him. Diamond went to her and rubbed Milos between his ears. The mangy thing hissed at him, bearing three yellowing fangs. Diamond let that one slide. Thanks for taking care of her. You couldn't have hauled Ars here a little quicker, though? Milos meowed, the sound indignant. He supposed it was a long way between Tokyo and New York when you couldn't teleport great distances. Milos must have teleported close to a hundred times to reach Cass as quickly as he had. He could only imagine how tiring that had been for him. Diamond made a mental note to treat the beast to some sushi-grade fish later. Cass turned her frown on the cat. You have a lot of explaining to do. Diamond knew she was talking to the cat, but the way she glanced at him made him feel she was talking to him instead. She was right. He did have a lot of explaining to do. Or at least a lot of apologizing. What happened after you slipped my grasp? Merrick finally lifted his head and Cass went to him, crouched before him and tucked Milos against her with one arm. She held her free hand over Merrick's thigh and warm light glowed from her palm. Beneath the rip in Merrick's dark trousers, the long gash in his thigh healed. Cass stood and gave him a black look. I landed in the underworld. Shit, Ares muttered. Merrick looked at Diamond. Diamond shrugged it off. Not your fault, man. She has a will of her own and apparently a knack for getting into trouble. Did you meet father? Concern lit Ares' dark eyes. 
She nodded and petted the cat. He was not charming, has a personality as black as yours. She flipped Karis a look. Karis narrowed green eyes on her. I hope you did not upset him. Diamond wanted to flash fangs at his brother for being more concerned about their father than her, but he knew where Karis was coming from. Hades in a bad mood was trouble for them all. His father had a short leash on his temper, and it snapped more often than not. I was delightful. He was not. Cass cuddled the cat and Diamond went to her. Just the thought of her facing his father left his blood cold and filled him with a need to hold her and know she was here now, safe with him again. I told him what had happened since he thought Diamond had died and presumed I was responsible because someone dropped me in the underworld with his blood on me. I didn't drop you, Merrick grumbled. Semantics, she countered, sighed and continued. I told him everything and he was displeased upon hearing Nemesis is a traitorous bitch. Ares looked at Karis. I'm guessing Escher didn't get a chance to send that messenger. For all we know, all messengers are now working against us. Karis twisted the silver band on his thumb, spinning it around, his gaze locked on it. What if others are too? Those words were spoken so quietly she almost didn't hear them. Ares ghosted a hand over Karis's shoulder. You know she wouldn't. Karis's green gaze snapped to his, rapidly darkening. Do I? I thought I knew her once. It turned out I was wrong. He disappeared, leaving black wisps of smoke behind that swirled in the air. Ares heaved a sigh. I'll track him down later. Give him five minutes to cool off. Diamond nodded in agreement. He couldn't remember the last time Karis had actually spoken of Enyo. While he didn't know what had happened between them, he knew it had hurt his brother. Still hurt him. Merrick scrubbed a hand around the back of his neck. At least you'll have to come to Tokyo if she wants to pass information to us now. That's me off the hook. Which sounded a lot like a catastrophe waiting to happen to Diamond. Valen nudged the dead fury with his boot and jerked backwards when she slid further down the melting ice shard. One down, eh? I'm not sure this is a good thing. Diamond looked at his brothers. We have one less enemy, but Nemesis is powerful, and the remaining Fury is going to want her sister back. Mari will be in danger, Cass said, worry shining in her blue eyes. They'll need her more now than ever. You too. Diamond brushed his palm over her cheek, fighting the darker side of his blood as it snarled at him to protect her. Meadow looked desperate when she left. I have a bad feeling she'll come after both Mari and you. She'll want Melody back. So we take the body, stick it on ice, draw them to us. Ares' eyes glowed in the low light as he growled. If she wants Melody back, she'll need the body. Maybe. I'm not sure. Some forms of necromancy work in other ways, using the soul as the catalyst. Cass leaned into Diamond's side and he rubbed her arm, held her to him and silently offered her comfort he hoped would allay her fears. No one was going to get their hands on her, or Mari. We should take it anyway, Valen put in and lifted his gaze to the treetops and the buildings beyond them. Just in case, things are still looking sketchy. Diamond nodded in agreement as he glanced at the horizon, seeing the other world. The sky blazed red, distant screams ringing in his ears, carried on the hot wind that blasted against him and sent flares of gold sparks spiraling up into the sky from the broken, burning buildings. He had expected it to look better, but he swore it looked worse. Because the final battle was drawing near? Maybe they could use Meadow's rage against her, using Melody's body to lure her into the open. Maybe being in possession of the bodies of both one of the Furies and the Wraith would work in their favor in other ways, too. They were two powerful allies that the enemy would definitely try to take back if they were determined to use Cass to revive their fallen. As far as Diamond could see, his side were holding all the cards. The enemy would be the one to make the next move, and it would be the first move of the final battle when it happened. He could feel it. What do we do about Nemesis? Merrick said. Your father dispatched legions to hunt for her. He believes she's still in the underworld. Cass stroked Milos. She'll be coming. Ares' hands glowed, flames licking over them as he clenched them into fists at his sides. Now that she's revealed herself, they're not going to rest. 
They're going to come at us with all they have to get a gate open and allow her through it, together with whoever else is on her side. Ares was right. The enemy were going to make one last stand. He and his brothers would be ready for them. He held Cass to him and amended that thought. He and his side would be ready for them. Everyone was a part of this war, and everyone was going to want to do all in their power to make sure that when it was over, they were victorious. I should close this gate. Diamond glanced over his shoulder in the direction of it. Tomorrow, Ares said. Tonight we rest and we plan. We go over everything we know and we make sure we haven't missed anything, and we wait for word from the underworld. If the legions fail to find Nemesis, then we'll call in a favor. Diamond didn't like the sound of that. What sort of favor? Ares' grim look said it all. Shit, man, Valen muttered and pulled his phone from his pocket. Charms dangled from it, one of a sword and shield catching Diamond's eye. I could just send her a message right now. Ares shook his head. Give him time. Diamond had the feeling that Karis was going to need far more time than they could afford to give him. They needed allies in this war. What better ally was there than a goddess who had been born for battle? Tokyo, Ares muttered. Merrick nodded and disappeared. Valen huffed, grabbed the dead fury, and followed him. Ares hesitated. Don't linger too long. Escher will want to see you're all right. Diamond dipped his chin, grateful for a few moments alone with Cass. His brother stepped. Diamond slipped his hand into Cass's and teleported with her, landing on the terrace of his hillside home in Hong Kong. All of the strength seemed to leak out of Cass and she looked up at him, tears catching the sunlight as they lined her lashes. Diamond sighed and brushed them away with his thumbs, turning them into diamonds of ice. I'm sorry. I never want to hurt you, but I just keep doing it. She smiled tightly. I like to think I give as good as I get. She did. He had lost track of all the scares she had given him, and they had only known each other for a few short weeks. Diamond gathered Cass to him, pressed his forehead to hers, and then drew back so he could see her face. God, she was beautiful. And a little bit angry with him. He smoothed his palm over her cheek trying not to think about the fact she had somehow ended up facing his father, but thankful that she had stood up to him. He could only imagine the hell she had given him. His mother probably adored her for that. He certainly adored her for it. He dipped his head and kissed her, savored the feel of her lips against his, and the warmth of her as it chased the cold from his heart, easing his fears and giving him comfort. She was safe now and he would keep her that way but not by sidelining her whenever things got rough. He would keep her at his side instead, right where he needed her to be, where they could fight as one, battling to survive and have that forever they both wanted, a forever he needed with all his heart. The coming fight wasn't going to be easy, he knew that, but with Cass at his side, together with his brothers and their women, he felt confident that they could win. They were the guardians of the underworld, protectors of Hades, not just him and his brothers, but Cass and the other women, too. Hell, even Mr. Milos. The bastard hissed at him again. Diamond gave him a black look. The cat purred louder, vying for attention as Diamond stroked Cass's cheek. As he looked into her blue eyes and saw the love in them, felt that love pouring into him through her caress, as she lifted her hand and placed her palm against his cheek, mirroring him. Diamond drew down a deep breath and found the courage to say something he had wanted to tell her so many times over the last few days. You were right, he husked and held her gaze. You did melt my heart. But you did so much more than that, too. You breathed life into it. Into me. He lowered his head and brought his lips to hers. I breathe for you now. Live for you. He whispered against her mouth. I love you, Cass, and I want to be with you. Forever. Cass brushed her lips across his, sending a shiver rolling through him. Heat and light that had the heart she now held in her hands melting as she murmured. I love you too. She kissed him softly at first, but then passionately, had his head spinning by the time she pulled back and smiled wickedly at him. And I'm holding you to that forever. No escape for you now. You're mine, Diamond. 
Diamond grinned and gathered her into his arms, careful not to crush Milos or harm the little prick with his ice as the feral beast growled at him, and breathed against her lips before he kissed her. You got me. The End This has been Diamond, Guardians of Hades Romance Series, Book Number 6, written by Felicity Heaton and narrated by Eric G. Dove. Copyright 2020 by Felicity Heaton. Production copyright 2020 by Felicity Heaton.